The first item is. Are we good? We're good. All right. On December 8th, 2021, I received a request from Councillor Mead to participate remotely in the December 9th, 2021 Stanton City Council meeting due to a family member's medical condition that prevents her physical attendance at the meeting. I will now entertain a motion to allow Councillor Mead's remote participation in this meeting pursuant to Stanton City Council Procedural Memorandum Number 3. Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. Pursuant to Stanton City Council Procedural Memorandum Number 3, I move to allow Councillor Mead to remotely participate in the December 9th, 2021 Stanton City Council meeting due to a temporary medical condition. Right, we have a motion. Is there a second? Mayor Oaks. Councillor um, Darby. I second that. All righty. We have a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Smith, please call the roll. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Um, Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Motion carries. All right. Next, I'll ask Councillor Mead to state the remote location from which she is participating. Councillor Mead, can you please state the remote participation from which you are participating for this meeting? I'm at 342 Sherwood Avenue, Stanton. Right. Could everyone on the city council as well as the audience hear Councillor Mead? Yes. All right. Welcome to the meeting. All right, the next item. On December 8th, 2021, I received a request from Councillor Dole to participate remotely in the December 9th, 2021 Stanton City Council meeting due to a family member's medical condition that prevents her physical attendance at the meeting. I will now entertain a motion to allow Councillor Dole's remote participation in this meeting pursuant to Stanton City Council's procedural memorandum number three. Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. Pursuant to Stanton City Council procedural memorandum number three, I move to allow Councillor Dole to remotely participate in the December 9th, 2021 Stanton City Council meeting due to a temporary medical condition. All right, there's a motion on the floor. Do we have a second? Mayor Oaks, this is Brenda Mead. Councillor Mead? I'll second that motion. All right, we have a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Smith, please call the roll. Mr. Claffey? Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson? Aye. Ms. Darby? Aye. Mayor Oaks? Aye. Ms. Mead? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Councillor Dole, will you please state the remote location from which you are participating? 1003 East Beverly Street, Stanton. Could everyone on the City Council as well as the audience here, Councillor Dole? Yes. Okay. yes. Welcome to the meeting. All right, so the next item is item number one, a consideration of work session and regular meeting agendas. I'll entertain a motion. Mm. Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. I move to approve the work session agenda and the regular meeting agenda as presented. Right, we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? This is Carol Lundahl. I'll second that. We have a second. Any further discussion? Mayor Oaks, this is Brenda Mead. Councillor Mead. I'd like to amend uh, the motion um, and, and uh, add to item G, uh, add a public comment opportunity prior to city council's consideration. So that would read, uh, the agenda item would read public comment and consideration of memorandum of understanding between County of Augusta and city of Stanton concerning Stanton and Augusta County courts and related resolution of city council. Okay. So do you want public, well, is there a second? This is Carol and Dahl, I'll second that. All right, we have a second. Any further discussion? So, Councillor Mead, are you stating that you want to have public comment prior to the vote tonight? Yes, okay. the item is on the agenda as item G in the regular meeting. Mm -hmm. I would like to simply allow the public to uh, provide input 
prior to city council considering the MOU. All right, any further this discussion? Is Carolyn, this is Carolyn Dahl. I do have a, 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 an area for clarification. Is the public comment specifically on that item uh, prior to that item being discussed? Is that the intent? And yes, then we have is. matters, we have a regular matters from the public on other items at the end. That's okay. correct. All right. All right, any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Smith, please call the roll. Mayor Oaks. No. Ms. Mead. Aye. Ms. Darby. No. Vice Mayor Robertson. No. Mr. Claffey. No. Ms. Dahl. Aye. Motion fails. All right. Did you want to say something, okay, Mr. That, Blair? That was a vote on the amendment. So now, unless there's an additional amendment, it would go back to voting on Vice Mayor Robertson's motion to approve the agenda. That's <clears throat> the procedure at this point. All right. Do we need a second for that? We do. All right. Is there a second? Mayor Oaks has a second. All right. We have a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Smith, please call the roll. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Mead. No. Mr. Uh, he's not here. Uh, Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Dull. Aye. Motion carries. All right. The next item is item two on the work session and item A and B on the um, regular meeting agenda a discussion of 2022 legislative program. Mr. Rosenberg. Thank you, Madam Mayor, Assistant City Manager, Leslie Beauregard will present this item. Thank you. Thank you. So this is a continued discussion of one that we started actually back in October, continued at the last meeting on November 11th. And you had in front of you at that time, a draft resolution that we discussed at that time. Um, since that time, uh, what has changed in that draft, draft resolution are two items that are in the memo. One is a clarification on Councilmember Darby's item regarding reporting of um, sexual battery. I had assault in the original language, but it should have been sexual battery. And the second item is an additional item at the request of Councilmember Dole, which is item X concerning cannabis legislation implementation. Um, so those are the only two changes that were made since the November 11th meeting. Uh, Delegate Avoli will be joining you all at 7.30, uh, which is following the first item on the regular agenda, which is a consideration of the 2022 legislative program. Uh, Senator Hanger, unfortunately, cannot be with us this evening. Um, and with that, I will open it up to discussion and questions. Are there any questions? Um, Vice Mayor Robertson. So, Councilor Dull, um, I understand under X1, City Council supports implementation of legislation to allow sales of cannabis to adults tw age 21 and older through the existing medical cannabis dispensaries in order to reduce illicit market transactions and provide safe regulated access to Virginians. And I'm assuming that is for medical sales, correct? Just I, I believe a, a lot of this language came from the BML legislative program. Okay. So I believe that the intent of, of the language is if, if uh, cannabis in general sales get legalized that we that we support the various um, controls and regulations and all that are listed in the in two and three. Okay, um, I I'll be honest with you. When it comes time to vote on this particular portion, I will be asking to take items X two and X three out. Uh, and this is just simply my personal belief. I, I'm 
probably one of the old fogies, but I really do think that cannabis can be a gateway drug. I also remember my schooling uh, back 30 some years ago and uh, where it said uh, to be blunt uh, that cannabis affects probably males more so than females. It affects uh, uh, sperm motility, actually some genetic issues that go on. I don't believe that would be proper, at least from my, my medical standpoint. And I fully believe, uh, as far as a, a, a Democrat, uh, uh, now Senator John Hickenlooper, uh, who was governor of the state of Colorado uh, at the time, uh, when Colorado, I believe, was one of the first states in the union that approved it. And John, Senator Hickenlooper, has made the statement, if I knew then what I know now, I would have never signed the legislation because the crime rate and the, uh, the accidents and everything that have been on the highways have skyrocketed in Colorado. So from that standpoint, I will support I item X1, but I will not two and three from this uh, counselor's point of view. Well, this, this is Carolyn Dolan. Just to clarify, items two and three are to ensure, for example, that training will be provided at state expense for our local law enforcement and other applicable local government personnel in terms of tax code enforcement, zoning, et cetera, on the new law and the regulations. So actually two and three are trying to safeguard the local government's financial and regulatory requirements by saying the state don't mandate, I mean, don't mandate this law and then leave us to to front the, the expense of training our police officers, et cetera. So I, I, I wish you would reconsider the two and three there because that's the intent of, of those. That, that's the VML language word okay. for word. So that's just simply, that's just simply trying to do the, the, the paperwork to clean up the language. You're, what you're saying is trying to lend support to uh, the police and, and law enforcement portion of it? Yeah, it's trying to uh, safeguard local governments from having um, to front the expense of training and any other regulatory issues that come up and to have, um, you know, it, it says the uh, they want participation by local governments in clarifying the local role so that we want to say in all that stuff. So it's just protecting local government uh, on this issue financially okay. and to, to have a say in how the regulations are, are created. Okay, I, th that's fine. I mean, I, I will support that. I reckon I would also add, and then that may, then I would say then this council also, though having said all that does not support the legalization of recreational marijuana. This is Brenda Mead. Hasn't that already been passed? I mean, with some provisions and requirements and that sort of thing, but I, I thought that had been passed. All right, fine. If it's been passed, fine. This city council does not support it. I, I'm well, just I would like that. to think that city council supports. I, yeah, I, what, I, I think it, are you in the state of Virginia, yeah, I think it's medical usage. I, I don't believe in the state of Virginia that recreational has been passed. I, I thought it had. Um, Mr. Blair? Um, <laughs> this is sort of an odd one. You're both right. Um, in the sense, it was enacted last year, um, but there was a provision that, in fact, this year the General Assembly has to vote on it again. Um, now, I will say this. Uh, take this for what it's worth. I mean, there are media reports. Obviously, the same party controls the Senate that controlled it the last session. Um, the Republicans have now taken the House of Delegates, taken control of the House of Delegates. Um, as some media reports indicate, though, that they aren't they aren't uh, going to 
or at least a few members have said they don't plan to vote against legalizing the recreational use this coming session, but that doesn't guarantee that a committee or subcommittee could, could still kill it. So that's a long-winded answer of saying, yes, they did legalize it last session, but they required a second vote this year. And with the change in party control, I guess it is still something of an open question. So that would that would only be I mean that would be my you know I, and I know I'm only one counselor I'm simply said I I do support legal use legal medical use but I do not support uh, recreational use of marijuana that's just this counselor's point of view and I I would ask that 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 particular language be put in there and then we can vote on it yay or nay as a council does that make sense Mr Rosenberg. Uh, uh Vice Mayor Robertson, I understand your position. What what would be helpful and what we need? We want to, um, while you all are in your closed meeting, we want to polish this sure. and make it ready for your consideration. So okay. I think on each of these issues, Ms. Beauregard has highlighted for you two changes. Okay. Um, I think that we need an informal count of council members on those two at least. And then if there are um, other issues that council members yet have concerning other provisions of the program, we need to hear about those also and deal with those during the work session so that while you all are in the closed meeting, we can, as I said, polish it and have it in a form ready for your consideration during the regular meeting. Okay. I Councilor Darby, that. did you have a comment? I just wanted to know again, we're we vote on the whole package, right? So Correct. even if I mean it's the whole package. That that answers my question. Thank you. Right. So Mr. Brenda Mead. Um <clears throat> go ahead, Councillor Mead. Um if we're if we're finished with that particular Ooh. item, I have a couple of other things. I think Councillor um, Claffy, did you have a comment? It, it was on a different item. So oh, okay. Go ahead, right. go, yeah, go so, ahead. Madam Mayor, can we can we try to come to closure on this, or did you want to wait? Oh uh, no, let's go ahead. And I, I would just simply say that this council supports the the language that Ms. Dole said as far as items after was after clarification. I, I'll do that. In other words, that item X was uh, VML language. I support that. But then I would say that uh, this council does not support the legalization of recreational marijuana. Is that clear enough? Mr. Blair, does that, do I need to word it differently or? No, I mean, that, that wording can, can be added into the package. Okay. Is that the way the majority feels? I was just I, I'm, saying, I, that, I'm just putting it out there. I was just getting ready to ask. So, right, I, I think. So, Councillor Dole, I'm assuming you would like to keep it the same as written. Yes, ideally. Okay, Councillor Mead, I I would like to see that uh, language stay as it is without any additional comments. Councillor Holmes, yes. Councillor Darby, I can support what. Vice Mayor Robertson is saying. Right. Councilor Claffey. I'm in agreement with Councilor Robertson. Of course. So if you can make the changes, Mr. Rosenberg. So um, if I can just so keep the existing language that council members yeah, know, no. but add. What right. you just, just simply add the phrase that the council does, uh, having said all this, you know, that, that the council does not support legalization of recreational marijuana. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. This is Carolyn Dahl. If, if we're going to add a statement like that, it should say uh, some of the council members don't support it. Because we haven't, we're not voting on the legalization. 
We're about, we're, and, yeah, the majority of the well, council. Well, you voted up or down, and the majority has has yes. said to so put it in. Majority, yeah, just put yeah. the majority said. That, yeah, the majority. That's fine. Majority. You okay with says, that? Says, yeah, right. yeah, absolutely. Are we good, Miss Beauregard? That item. You yeah. got it. Okay. All right, uh, Councillor Mead. Yes, item six uh, H six. I think it is. The General Assembly should reinstate the requirement that school principals alert law enforcement about misdemeanor offenses that occur on school property, for example, et cetera, et cetera. And I oppose the addition of that item for two reasons. First, the issue should be addressed by the school board in their legislative agenda, uh, as frankly, I think they have a greater understanding of the issues around um, incarcerating children. Um, and the impact that it has uh, on, on their families. And then second, I think the item's too broad. Uh, uh, if, you, if you stop at uh, reporting misdemeanor offenses that, cool, that occur on school property, um, it, 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 it could be any, any nonviolent misdemeanor offense. And I believe a school principal should have the discretion to decide whether to call law enforcement, in particular for a nonviolent, uh, quote, misdemeanor. And, and it also puts principals into the position of making, a, making some kind of legal determination whether, whether something is chargeable as a misdemeanor or a felony or uh, any crime. Um, and then I just want to add that, you know, exposure to uh, early exposure to incarceration impact, impacts children of color and low income families unfairly. Families can't afford private uh, legal counsel that results in worse outcomes for children whose families, compared to children whose families can afford to hire attorneys. Uh, if children in our schools need counseling and help as the mayor suggested that we wanna make sure these folks get help, uh, I can tell you that they're not going to get help in jail. They're not going to get mental health support, they're not going to get counseling, The counseling should happen in the schools. So if we really want to improve uh, and address issues, um, it, it should be by supporting more, more uh, mental health support, more mental health counseling in the schools. Are there any additional comments? Councillor Darby? Mary, I agree, Ms. Mead. I think that having more counseling in the schools is always something that um, would be beneficial to lots of young people. Um, the reason that I think that this is you know, important, it's, it's just simply saying there's such a fine line already between school officials who are mandated reporters um, that this is just saying simply, it's not saying that you know, a juvenile is gonna be arrested or that they're gonna be incarcerated. It's simply saying that schools are to mandate that allegations be reported to law enforcement. And then law enforcement, they do their due diligence to determine what happens next. And then in a juvenile situation, um, there's, a, there's a lot of steps that happen um, before they get to the extreme result that you're talking about. Yeah. Vice Mayor Roberts. Did I not, maybe I, did I not hear that it would, you, that Ms. Beauregard changed that to be and also sexual I mean, or totally, I miss her. This is a result of legislation that was passed several years ago okay. that um, removed the requirement that principals report certain types of misdemeanors. Okay. Okay. I originally had assault. That was incorrect. Oh, assault okay. is always reported. <laughs> yeah. It's battery and other these examples in here. So all Miss Miss Darby which Ms. Darby, I believe, is asking is to return it before that legislation was passed. Is that right, Ms. Darby? Yeah. Okay. And so um, that's what this, that's basically, this used to be in place. It's not in place any longer. I believe it was changed during the 2020 session. And so that's where, that's where this is coming from. So. Madam Mayor. Mr. Rosenberg. Uh, um, I heard something that Ms. Mead said, and so uh, I want to see whether I can ap approach this and maybe suggest some language that makes everybody happy. One of the things that I thought I heard Ms. Mead say is that this is very broad, 
and that as it's phrased, it would require the reporting of any misdemeanor. Listening to Ms. Beauregard, I understand the legislation was specific to certain misdemeanors. So what if we change the language to say the General Assembly should reinstate the requirement that school principals alert law enforcement about the following misdemeanor offenses when they occur on school property, colon, alleged sexual battery, stalking, violation of protective order, and violent threats, period. I, yes. I can agree with that. That's good. That's so good. it tightens it down to those specific offenses. Would that work for you, Ms. Mead? Uh, yes, it would. I still maintain that this should be in the school's legislative agenda. And I would ask Ms. Darby, since she's the liaison to the school board, if you have suggested this to members of the school board. I have not, but I will. I think that's a good suggestion, Ms. Mead. This is Carolyn Dahl. I, I, I'm opposed to having it in our legislative program for that very reason. This is a school board issue. I have tried throughout my career on council not to uh, step over that line and, and start acting like I have anything to do with what happens in our schools other than funding them. All right. Mayor Oaks, I have another um, item. All right, Councilor Mead. Item V, um, uh, the um, support for uh, eliminating the sales tax on uh, home on food for home consumption. I oppose the reduction or elimination of the sales tax on food for home consumption. The annual cost of the city of Stanton and our schools would be nearly $1.8 million. That's roughly equivalent to eight cents on the property tax rate. And further, uh, it does very little to reduce food insecurity. Um, those who receive SNAP benefits, who are at the lower levels of income, they're, they're, uh, those benefits are already exempt from grocery tax. So if you do some calculating, the average annual grocery purchase for those whose incomes are in the lower levels is about $3,500 a year. So if you eliminate the grocery tax, that saves that fam family $87 a year. The, the people that it helps frankly, are those who are in the higher income brackets because uh, they spend an average of $12,000 a year on groceries for home consumption. So it saves them $300 a year. So I, I don't see how this really contributes to uh, eliminating or reducing food insecurity. And, and it will cost this city $1.8 million. Um, as an alternative, I'm willing to accept the item if it says, and this is the uh, Virginia First Cities legislative program uh, wording, uh, sales tax on food, fo food for home consumption, city council asked General Assembly to reduce or eliminate yada yada uh, to assist in food security. However, this is the part I would like to have added. However, if there is an elimination of the food for home consumption grocery tax, uh, consumption tax, uh, parentheses, grocery tax, then there should be a replacement of lost revenues to localities. Councillor uh, Darby. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, I, I, you know, I just think that, that we talk all the time, we always get wrapped up in, you know, you know, this tax or that tax and, you know, food, I mean, Miss Mead, you make a, a compelling argument, but food is something that, you know, eliminating the tax on that, you know, it benefits everybody. And I, I do agree to what your, um, your recommendation is addition or whatever, because I, I think that, you know, as we, we'll see in the future, um, that that's probably something that's a, um, going to happen. So. So it's my understanding the incoming governor is going to um, enforce this anyway. Yeah, um, right. and that for it, one year. For yes. one year, and that it's going to be a 2% given back to the localities. Mr. Rosenberg, have you heard anything about this? And it's going to be on just certain uh, certain food items? We don't. 
This is Carolyn Dahl. The governor doesn't do this. It would be the general assembly. Well, it's my understanding. To... It's my understanding. He's he's planning on um enforcing it. So enforcing. I, I... There's no law yet, so he can't he can't enforce it until the general assembly uh, votes to okay. do this. Well, I, I'm opposed I... to it because we've all seen what happened with that fa famous soundbite: no car tax. We are not being. We, we never were reimbursed for, for the, the money that we lost as a locality. We're getting like 30% on, on the uh, relief. It was a joke. The same thing will happen with this, uh, this tax. If they do away with it and they're going to replace it, we won't ever get the actual money. So my question is, at $1.8 million, what are you going to cut? How many policemen are you going to lay off? How many firemen uh, go go down the, the that route? Uh, do we close a library? Do we shut down a school? What are you going to do for 1.8 million? Raise okay. taxes. <laughs> so again, it is my understanding the governor is planning on enforcing it through. However, it does deal with a tax, so it does have to go through the general assembly. Um, but his plan is to do it for a year and a 2% paid back to the localities for certain food items. That's my understanding. Um, but now, with what, with, well, hold on, hold on. With what's yeah. been proposed, I'm, I'm in agreement with what's been proposed. So the, the sentence at the end would be, however, if there is an elimination of the food for home consumption tax, uh, quotation or, or parentheses grocery tax, close parentheses, then there should be a replacement of lost revenue to localities. Yep, I agree to that. That's fine. Madam Mayor. Yes, Carol Mr. Adult, it needs to say it must be, not should be, must be. I agree with that. E even though they won't, but. Mr. Rosenberg. Ms. Mead, um, just for ease on our end. I have the VSC, VFC legislative agenda that was emailed within the past day or two. Are you reading directly from that? Um, it, no, I modified it. The actual uh, VFC agenda said that uh, it, it, something to the effect that if, you know the long history shows that what the legislature takes away, it never gives back. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing, which is uh, exactly Carolyn Dull's uh, point. Um, so, you know, I, and I would feel much more comfortable if uh, if someone could show me the actual proposed legislation. But I've I've been following uh, all month. I've been looking at what's what's proposed. Uh, there's nothing yet. I haven't seen any legislation pr proposed yet. If, so, you're, if you're reading from something, would it be too much trouble for you to email it to Ms. Beauregard and me? I will do that. Thank you. Yeah. All right. I have another so, item. Okay. Well. Well. So, do we want the uh, the one word to say um, must or shall or must. must must be a replacement of lost revenue? You okay with that? I'm okay with that. It's fine. Okay. All right. Your your next item, Councillor Mead. My next item has to do with uh, inserting an item before. Uh, item O about Middle River Regional Jail. Um, the city requests the General Assembly place greater emphasis on the overall reduction of our incarcerated population through criminal justice reform. This will reduce overcrowding and the need to expand our jails. Criminal justice reform should address the need to equalize compensation for public defenders, a requirement that an attorney to be uh, an attorney be present for defendants at every judicial hearing, and eliminating the incentives for Commonwealth attorneys to up charge up charge, excuse me, and eliminating incarceral penalties for nonviolent crimes such as drug possession and and sale, failure to appear, and non-payment of fines and fees. It, within our current system of incarceration, you know. Uh, it, it is in many ways a debtor's prison. If people uh, miss a payment, if they can't afford to, to pay their penalties and fees, if they, 
if they if they miss a hearing because uh, because they've lost their job and they don't have transportation or because you know their job is an hour away, uh, you know they end up back in jail again, and it's just wrong. Uh, and we so so if we're going to suggest that. Uh, that uh, we want positions filled at the jail, we want to spend more money on incarceration. Uh, I think we also need to support um, uh, more, eff more efforts to, um, uh, to uh, um, change our system. All right, any comments? This is Carolyn Dahl. My, my only other comment on the, the jail is that I think uh, DOC should be required to uh, pay uh, the actual cost of housing their, their inmates in our jail. So that could be added to item O? Because I wanted to insert something prior to that item. So, Councillor Dole, did you want that added? Sure. I, yeah. Council I, think, I think there's a consensus across the state from localities that uh, that are are spending, you know, what five times what DOC pays to house their inmates. Yeah, because I, mean, I think they're reimbursing at twelve dollars a day. Yeah. Which is, you know, ridiculous. So if we can go back to Ms. Mead's yeah. initial proposed addition, which I would also ask her to email to us if it turns out that, that, that it's the consensus of council to include that language, I, it, we need to know whether that is in fact the consensus. Is that the, the only thing I just want to make sure, clarify, Ms. Mead, that you are, I want to make sure that you're not including uh, changing uh, or doing away with bail bonds and all this type of thing that's going on in the national scene right now, just letting people basically walk for doing, you know, uh, I've got an issue with that. But I mean, you know, I don't have a problem with what I heard. I just want to make sure that that language that you spoke does not include that type of, of change. No, it, no, I didn't say anything about eliminating. Okay, uh, okay, that's so fine. But I, I will say this though, uh, that, that those who cannot afford bail or to bond themselves, you know, pay the bond and get bailed out, those who cannot afford are incarcerated. And so, so, it, so the system that we have favors people who can afford to hire private counsel. It favors people who can afford to pay bail and and uh, and that that is unjust, and that is where we that's an area we need to focus on, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, the financial uh, impact on families and on individuals. So some two people commit the same are 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 before a magistrate for the same crime. The one who has their own attorney will will generally get off uh, with uh, uh, being released on their own recognizance. Uh, more often than the person who doesn't have uh, their own attorney. And that's why I think it's important that a, an attorney be present, as I said, uh, at every judicial hearing. And, uh, and I mean, those, uh, it, it's unfair. Our system is unfair. If we're going to release the two people, if we're going to release, release one person because they have more money and keep the other in jail, uh, I, I think that's wrong and that needs to get fixed. Okay, Mr. Rosenberg. Yes. Do you understand the changes for Councillor Mead as well as Councillor Dole? Yes. Okay. And again, I would ask Ms. Mead to email that language to us as well. I am. I'm doing that now. Thank you. All right, Councillor Clappy. In the uh, in the K under the fair elections, there's a uh, the last sentence reads. Further, council urges the General Assembly to explore and implement additional strategy for encouraging increased voter participation, including automatic registration and expand voting hours. Did this take into effect the fact that this year our, our voting season, not our voting day, but our voting season started yeah. on September 17th, 
included sun, Saturday hours, and it actually became a, a stretch on the, the voter staff because they were having to go outside in the uh, parking garage to handle people that were coming. They couldn't get out of vehicles. They were trying to man the, the desk and they, were, they needed numerous people to do all this. So I don't see where we're, we're getting funding for expanded voting hours. And I wonder if this was originally written this summer before we went to expanded voting hours, because I am not in favor of expanding it farther than 45 days out. I think that would become the opportunity for malfeasance to go on when it goes on for more than 45 right. days. Yeah. And so I am not in favor of the expanded voting hours over and above what we had this past year. Boat harvesting and everything else. Exactly. So I am. Uh, I would like to see that the expanded voting hours struck. And I think we had plenty this past which, year. Which line is that? Very last line. Very last line. Which number is that? A. Hey. 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 Carol, no, it, that's already stricken, isn't it? I see no, it. No, which, no, which I see a red line. Uh, yep. In the last paragraph, it says, for encouraging increased voter participation, including automatic registration and expanded voting hours. Madam Mayor, if I can explain, I think I know Certainly. what Ms. Dole is looking at. This is, there was a change in formatting. So this language is the same as last year's legislative program, but the formatting changed just a bit. So it shows that language being stricken, Ms. Dole, and it shows it being added, Mr. Claffey, but the but all of that is simply because there was a change in formatting. In last year's version, they were two bulleted items, automatic registration and expanded voting hours. Now we just pulled it up into the body of the paragraph. So the language is exactly the same as it was in the program that was adopted by council last year. But if council wishes to take a different position this year, then you know, we're, we're prepared to make that change. Yes, because this is what, um, what I'm saying is I don't think we need expanded hours this year compared to the prior year because right. we got them this year. We already had the expanded season, the 45 days, which is more than adequate. And it was tough for, <laughs> it was tough for Molly and her crew to cover. So I'm saying, I'm, you know, you had an opportunity to vote. This is Carolyn Dole. I, I think it's semantics because uh, we're not saying expanding which would be to increase the hours it's is expanded that's like what's already been done that, that's how i read that well i just want to read that you know stay where we are no no further expansion needed i i, I just want to understand uh uh mr claffey are you talking about expanded voting days or hours yes. Both, both. Uh, and and so you feel that the voting hours are currently adequate to give uh, folks who work day shifts um, or work and, well, and can't, you know, uh, one you thing think they're be, adequate? One thing I became aware of this year, if you sign up to work in the polls as a poll worker, you're required to be there for the entire shift. So the shift starts at 6 a.m. and they they have orientation at 5 a.m. And then you are required to stay until closing, which is 7 p.m. And then they shut the polls down at 8. And they're losing prospective employees who are not willing to work that many hours. And they don't do shifts. If you're involved on election day, you have to work the whole day in the polls to witness, you know, when you say you can sign off. So you, you have a lot of days available to vote before election day. Election day itself is going from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m., which requires an hour in front and behind the shift. So their staff is burnt out. So that's why I am not in favor of any expanded hours you have a 45 day 45 window, day window. that's yeah. plenty. So I'm, I'm trying to say no further expansion of hours. 
You're talking about on election day. I, I'm talking about the whole season. I mean, 45 not, days. I mean, 45 there was, days. There were no. Saturdays available. Yeah, and you're not taking that away. I, I, mean, I am not doing yeah. anything to any of that. Just no further expansion because Molly's staff is is run ragged already. Mr. Rosenberg, do you understand the? I do understand the request to delete the words and expanded voting hours. And so, what we need is to know whether a majority of council would like to see that change made. Yes. 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 Um, Councillor Holmes, you're okay with it. All right, Councillor Mead. As long as it doesn't read in a way that would say that that this city council does not support the current expanded voting hours or days. I, I would not want to see any reduction of hours or days to the current system. Not proposed. Yep. Uh, all it says, Ms. Mead, all it will say is further council urges the General Assembly to explore and implement additional strategies for encouraging increased voter participation, including automatic registration. Period. Period. There's nothing in there about taking away anything. Correct. Councillor Dole? I'm okay with that. All right, Mr. Rosenberg. Okay, anything else? All right, Ms. Beauregard, Mr. Rosenberg, do you have everything you need? Yes, and we'll uh, have a revised version for you at your regular meeting that highlights these changes uh, and that's ready for your consideration. Okay, thank you. And right, that takes us on, we're running, a, well, we're running over, but um, that takes us on to roll call. I'll start um, with Councillor Claffey. Uh, Mr. Roseberg, any update on the animal situation in Waynesboro? My understanding, Mr. Claffey, is that the uh, period to respond to proposals closed um, yesterday, okay. that there were two proposals received. I have not seen those proposals. I do not know who submitted them. Um, and so the next step will be for the evaluation committee um, established by the city manager in Waynesboro to review the proposals. And I'll have a further update for council at the first meeting in January, if not sooner. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Vice Mayor Robertson. I, I don't have anything at this time. Councillor Darby. I don't have anything. Councillor Holmes, nothing. Councillor Mead. No. Councillor Dole. Yeah, my question is, why do we continue having this roll call? There was never an agreement amongst all council to do it. It was just a suggestion from facilitators, and it seems not to be very productive. Well, I think the majority of the council agreed to move forward with it. Well, at the retreat, uh, mm -hmm. it was very clear that uh, anything that was uh, considered at the retreat had to be uh, the consensus, the unanimous, everyone had to agree uh, of what came out of that retreat. I was not in favor of it because I don't, I don't understand why you would wait till a meeting to bring up some issue. Well, you can bring um, up an issue at any time. Correct. So I, I don't see the point of this roll call being included every, every meeting and most people don't have anything. And sometimes it seems like people are struggling to think of something to ask. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't really take up that much time if we don't ask anything. So I don't see that. I mean, I don't yeah. see a problem with it. I think that it's sometimes helpful, you know, the public, you know, just like Mr. Claffey just asked the city manager that question, you know, those folks that are listening, I mean, they have more information now than maybe they did before. And I think that's a, always a positive thing. Has anybody toured that place? Anybody? Been I've there? been there before, but I no, I have, yeah. I've been there before. Okay. So at this point, we're running over. Let's take um. 
we have one minute to take a break. I would suggest, <laughs> Madam Mayor, that you go ahead and entertain a motion to go into the closed meeting yeah, and then like... take your break while we deal with the change in the technology. That sounds like a good idea, Mr. Rosenberg. All right, I'll entertain a motion to go into a closed time. meeting for one consultation with legal counsel for necessary legal related advice and discussion regarding the order to show calls concerning the Stanton Juvenile and Domestic Relations District Courts facilities, two, discussion and consideration of prospective clerk of council candidates, and three, discussion pertaining to the performance and evaluation of the city manager. Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. I move to enter a closed meeting for number one, consultation with legal counsel for necessary legal related advice and discussion regarding the order to show calls that was served on each council member concerning the Stanton Juvenile and Domestic Relations District Court facility located in the District Courts building at 6 East Johnson Street, Stanton. Pursuant to Virginia Code 2.2-3711A7 .2 and 2.2-3711A8. Number two, Discussion and consideration of prospective clerk of council candidates pursuant to Virginia Code 2.2-3711A1. And number three, discussion pertaining to the performance and evaluation of the city manager pursuant to Virginia Code 2.2-3711A1. There's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? A second. Councilor Tim. Holmes. A second. Any further discussion? Yes, Ms. this Smith? is Carolyn Dahl. Uh, Dahl. Why are we having closed meetings when some council members are relating everything that was discussed in the closed meetings to some people? And so now what we're doing is some people know everything that's going on in closed meetings, and then other citizens don't know anything. So why don't we just have open meetings on everything? At least our citizens would equally know what's going on. Any further discussion? Mr. Blair, did you want to respond to that? Okay. All right. Ms. Smith, please call the roll. Ms. Mead. Ms. Aye. Mead. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Dull. No. Ms. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Motion carries. All right, we're now in a closed meeting. Madam Mayor. Oop, excuse me. All right, Vice Mayor Robertson. Madam Mayor, uh, I move the council reconvene in an open meeting and certify to the best of each member's knowledge that only lawfully exempted public business matters were discussed and that only public business matters as identified in the closed meeting motion were heard, discussed, or considered in the meeting. All right, we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? I'll second that, Ms. All right, Councillor Holmes is second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Smith, please call the roll. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Dull. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Motion carries. All right. Thank you. We are now on break. We will be back at 7:30 for the regular meeting. As mayor of the city of Stanton, Virginia, I call the regular meeting for the Stanton City Council to order for December 9th, 2021, 7.30 p.m. The first item on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. If you would like to join me, please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible, 
All right, so the next item is the invocation moment of silence and tonight is Councillor Dole. Thank you. I'd like to uh, request a moment of silence as we have uh, entered what's traditionally the holiday season starting with Thanksgiving with, with numerous uh, types of holidays of all faiths and um, ethnicities between now and uh, New Year's Eve. And New Year's Day, we make resolutions. So we're, this is the last council meeting before all of that, that time frame. So I would like to uh, have a moment to reflect that everyone in this country and in this city should bow to only live by integrity and, and do what's best for their fellow citizen and for their locality and their state and their country and stop the lies and stop the misinformation. We have to, we're, we're either gonna live together or we're gonna die together. And it's that serious now. And I think it's worthy of a little reflection on how we need to work together uh, to make our city and our state and our country better for all of us. Thank you. All right, thank you. The next item is the mayor's report. Um, I would just like to remind everyone that um, we still have a mask mandate at City Hall. So while you're in City Hall, if you can please uh, wear your mask. All right, the first item is a proclamation, Stanton Kindness Challenge Week. City of Stanton, Virginia proclamation. Stanton Kindness Challenge Week, December 6th through the 10th, 2021. Whereas the Stanton Kindness Challenge was created in 2021 by Stanton City Schools, inspired by numerous other kindness campaigns in Virginia and the nation. And whereas the Stanton Kindness Challenge is designed to spread goodwill, good deeds, and good vibes in Stanton schools and the community. And whereas Stanton City Schools proudly demonstrates its commitment to improve schools climate and increase student engagement by hosting the Stanton Kindness Challenge. And whereas Stanton City Schools encourages the Stanton community to join its students, staff and families in performing as many kind deeds as possible. And whereas Stanton City Schools is honored to unite all students in the spirit of kindness and respect. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by Stanton City Council that December 6th through the 10th, 2021 is hereby designated as Stanton Kindness Challenge Week, where kindness matters in the city of Stanton and the Stanton City Schools, Andrea W. Oaks, Mayor. And it's my understanding that Dr. Smith, I sure. You are here to. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All, right. <clears throat> All right, ready? Let's get this way. One, two, three. Thanks, Michelle. Uh -huh. so much, Mayor Oates, members of City Council. Um, we're really happy to have kicked off our, our State and Kindness Challenge this week. And you'll notice we didn't call it the State and City Schools Kindness Challenge. We call it the State and Kindness Challenge because we want to bring the whole city and the whole community with us. We have had all kinds of fun this week. I hope you've seen some of our presence on social media. Um, the shirts that we're wearing, we've bought shirts for every student every staff member, and we have spares. We have some shirts for you all up there, as well as some goodie buckets. 
So feel free to throw your shirts on if you'd like to. Uh, we also have yard signs. This one has actually already been claimed by Christine Polson. But if you want your, if you want a yard sign, you can email me or just let Morgan know, and I'll and I'll make sure I get the signs to everybody. Um, again, the idea is to talk to kids about what they should be saying and what they should be doing instead of about what they shouldn't be saying and what they shouldn't be doing. You know, we're we're getting back to the basics. It's really been contagious. We've we've had all kinds of stories um, from families about their kids coming home and exhibiting this new brand of kindness to their brothers and sisters and uh, and uh, kids giving away toys it's really been it's really been a blast uh, we had strides of donuts uh, earlier this week we did pizza and salad for everybody um, people are getting notes of appreciation and it, like we said it, it has really been so much fun and I didn't know if anybody had any questions about it I'd be happy to answer any questions but I also want to let you know that our website is www.stantonkindnesschallenge.org if you need any information. And you'll see all kinds of pictures from the schools populating that site. We've had community groups uh, join in with us. Um, and we were at the basketball game Tuesday night. We'll be at the girls, that was the boys, we'll be at the girls next Tuesday night, handing out all this stuff. And um, we're just excited for it to, to take off. We'll have designated kindness days every month for the rest of the year. We're gonna keep all this going. And uh, we feel really good about changing the narrative on this school year and making school fun again. That's wonderful. Are there any questions? Uh, Dr. Smith, would you like to introduce the uh, school board members and the school staff that joined you? Yes, I, I'd love to do that. So to my left, we have our school board chair, Ken Venable. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Dr. Bradley Wagner. Strategic Planning and Partnerships, Ruth Jones Turner. And School Board Member Christine Polson. And thank you so much to all of you for your support. Well, thank, thank you. you. And, yeah. and thank you for the staff and school board members for attending tonight. Um, what a great idea. I mean, just a little bit of kindness can go a long it's, way. It sure can. It so, sure can. When well, it's gonna, needed now. <laughs> yeah, more than ever. Well, I'll buy someone a coffee that's behind me in the drive through <laughs> right. Y'all have a great night. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for the uh, goodies. You're welcome. All right. So the next item, I would like to explain why we are wearing um, the get up. So tonight's meeting was supposed to be ugly holiday sweater meeting, um, which we have a few ugly ties. <laughs> <laughs> I know they're kind of cute. They're kind of cute. So if you're wondering why we're dressed like this, it's for the holidays, just to spread a little kindness and cheer. Um, the next item, I would just like to remind everyone about the celebration of holiday lights that's at the uh, Gypsy Hill Park. Uh, on the 17th of this month, I will be an elf handing out candy canes. So come on down and join me. The very next day for the Stanton Downtown Development Association, I will be working at Santa's Elf's Workshop um, as an elf. And I believe, Morgan, you'll be, what are the times for that? That's 10 to 2. 10 to 2. So once again, I'll be dressed up as an elf if you'd like to come down. Um, now, Morgan, they have something going on every weekend leading up to Christmas, right? They do. This weekend, in fact, at the Woodrow Wilson birthplace, they are having a gingerbread cottage where people can stop by from 10 to 2. Pictures with Santa and Mrs. Claus, as well as being able to do all kinds of activities presented by the um, KK Homes and the birthplace. Wonderful. Um, and lastly, I would just like to wish everyone happy holidays. I hope it's filled with lots of fun and happiness. All right, the next item is the additional items by members of council. Do any members of council have anything to report? Um, Madam Mayor. All right, Councilor Claffey. Madam Mayor, the nominations committee met on December 8, 2021, and I'd like to make the following motions. To appoint Judge Robin Mayer and Sheriff-elect Chris Hartless to the Blue Ridge Criminal Justice Board, for two-year terms beginning January 1, 2022 and ending December 31st, 2024.
to appoint Jason Clark to the library board for a four-year term beginning January 1st, 2022 and ending December 31st, 2026. To appoint Alyssa McDonald to the Recreational Advisory Committee for a three-year term beginning January 1st, 2022 and ending December 31st, 2025. To appoint Paige Hildebrand as the Frontier Culture Museum representative on the Tourism Advisory Board for an indefinite term. To appoint Steve Guerin to the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee to fill the unexpired term of Trafford McRae ending June 30th, 2023. To reappoint Assistant City Manager Leslie Beauregard, Commonwealth Attorney Jeffrey Gaines, and Peter Boatner to the Blue Ridge Criminal Justice Board for two-year terms beginning July 1st, 2022 and ending December 31st, 2024. To reappoint Bill Crisp to the Lewis Creek Watershed Advisory Committee for a three-year term beginning January 1st, 2022 and ending December 31st, 2025. To reappoint Adam Campbell to the Planning Commission for a four-year term beginning February 1st, 2022 and ending January 31st, 2026. And to reappoint David Rissmeyer to the Redevelopment and Housing Authority for a four-year term beginning February 1st, 2022 and ending January 31st, 2026. All right, so we have a motion on the floor. We do not need a second because this is coming out of committee. Um, is there any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Smith, please call the roll. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Dull. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Motion carries. All right, thank you. Are there any other additional items by members of council? This is Brenda Mead. I have a couple of things. All right, Councillor Mead. Thank you. Uh, uh, first, I attended a webinar that was hosted by George Mason University in the past couple of weeks. Um, the topic was criminal justice reform. Um, uh, it was an incredible amount of information presented in just a one hour period of time. But the bottom line is that we have the choice. We either reform our criminal justice system or we keep incarcerating people and uh, either, either deal with the overcrowding that that results in or uh, deal with the enormous continuing cost to taxpayers of supporting mass incar incarceration. So that was the first item. Second, uh, I, was, I attended the uh, Central Shenandoah Planning District uh, Commission meeting, a regional housing assessment, uh, and heard that the um, CSPDC uh, has been awarded a $2 million grant uh, to address um, affordable housing issues uh, in their region. Uh, it's $2 million uh, could end up being spread like peanut butter, but uh, it can make a difference probably in about uh, an estimated 20 people's lives to make uh, either their housing suitable and adequate and safe or to uh, build new housing to meet the needs of um, of citizens who are uh, who cannot afford uh, good housing. And then uh, in addition, uh, I, I received a number of uh, questions um, this week from citizens uh, regarding our process for uh, developing agendas for these meetings and for the requirements of um, to, to get uh, public hearings scheduled. Uh, first, I'll address the public hearings issue first. Um, this is available um, on the City Council Procedures Memorandum Number 17 for you to read in detail, but essentially the mayor as an individual or any two members of City Council can, together can request a public hearing. And those, the procedures for doing that are outlined, as I said, in Procedures Memorandum, memorandum Number 17. And I want to make it clear, uh, very clear that the city manager has no authority to deny a request from council members to hold public hearings. Uh, it is strictly up to the city council. Um, a, a majority vote of city council can uh, lead to a public hearing. Uh, and so I just wanted to make sure that was clear. 
uh, as I said, I got several questions about that this week. I want to clear up an additional item uh, that uh, the agenda uh, and how we develop an agenda. The uh, it's first uh, the develop the, the the agenda is first compiled by the city manager uh, based on requests submitted by either members of council, uh, city staff, uh, the city attorney, uh, and citizens. Um, that agenda is reviewed and approved uh, with and by the mayor prior to distribution to the public. Um, and that agenda will include matters that may be, uh, may, uh, be proposed to be discussed in closed session. So it, it, there's no mystery to the, the matters that are being proposed to be discussed in closed sessions. Those are, uh, those are available, those are made known to members of council and they are on the agenda. And uh, prior to each city council meeting, uh, council members have the opportunity to vote, to approve the agenda as it is, uh, vote to amend the agenda if they choose to do so. And, uh, and that includes voting whether or not to hold uh, uh, closed sessions uh, on the subjects that have been presented to us. So I, I think it's important, as I said, I've gotten several questions this week um, I'm not sure where they, how they, how they arose, but uh, I just wanted to make sure that was clear. Thank you. Right. Any additional comments? I would like to go, go ahead, Councillor Carolyn Dahl. I just wanted to mention that I attended the first uh, transportation uh, work group of a. Uh, it's kind of a, a collective they call it, uh, facilitated by JMU but with uh, constituents uh, and organizations, nonprofits, government, there, it's, a, it's a, a mix of people in our communities in the region uh, that, that kind of mimics the Central Senadol Planning District Commission and part of the Northwestern um, Planning District Commission. Uh, and, and so we're looking at transportation issues and we're going to be uh, all of the work groups that are forming from this consortium is is uh, is is supposed to prioritize and work come up with fixes to the problems within twelve months. So this is this is supposedly not just meeting for the sake of meeting, but actually getting things done, whether it's writing for grants or or whatever. So. I'm on the transportation work group. And then next week I will be attending, uh, and these are all Zoom because it, it's crazy for people to drive. <clears throat> uh, uh, I'm on the affordable housing work group next week. I also had recommended uh, one, another Stanton citizen who has uh, some expertise in, in housing uh, to join me on that work group. So I'll be reporting on that after we after we have our first meeting. Thank you. All right, one point of clarification. The mayor votes on the agenda with everyone else on council because all of our votes are equal. And that's done at the beginning of the work session. All right, moving on to the next item. That's the approval of the minutes. I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes for the work session and regular meeting of November 11th, 2021. Madam Mayor. Councilor Clavy. I move that we approve the minutes as presented for the work session and regular meeting of November 11th, 2021. We have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Second. Councilor Holmes, second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Smith, please call the roll. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Ms. Dull. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. The next item is the regular meeting. Item A is a consideration of resolution establishing the City of Stanton's 2022 legislative program. Mr. Rosenberg. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Assistant City Manager Leslie Beauregard will present this item. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Uh, so you all should have copies in front of you of the latest version that we discussed during the work session. Um, Council members Dull and Mead, I emailed you a copy, so there should be a copy in your email. 
And I'm going to read specifically the changes so everybody hears them as well. Um, so what you see as the alterations are the changes made between the work set that were made at the work session, and those are the only redlined items that you see. So to start on page two under education, item six, which is line 49 through 53, this has been reworded to the following. The General Assembly should reinstate the requirement that school principals alert law enforcement of the following misdemeanor offenses when they occur on school property. And then it lists several examples, alleged sexual battery, stalking, violation of protective order, and violent threats. The second change made is on page four under fair elections, section K. It's the last item on, it's on line 152. And what was removed from this was further council urges that this, well, what was removed is and expanded voting hours at the very end, but I'll read the whole sentence. Further council urges the General Assembly to explore and implement additional strategies for encouraging increased voter participation, including automatic registration period and expanding voting hours is removed, recognizing that much of that has already occurred. On page five, there's a new section O called criminal justice reform that starts on line 209. And I'll just read this entire section because it is new. City council requests that the general assembly place greater emphasis on the overall reduction of our incarcerated population through criminal justice reform. This will reduce overcrowding and the need to expand our jails. Criminal justice reform should address the need to equalize compensation for public defenders, a requirement that an attorney be present for defendants at every judicial hearing, eliminate the incentives for Commonwealth attorneys to upcharge, and eliminate incarceral penalties for nonviolent crimes, such as drug possession and sale, failure to, failure to appear, and non-payment of fines and fees. On the next page six, under this is under Middle River Regional Jail, the second item, the very last sentence, this section speaks to um, the director of Virginia Department of Corrections accepting eligible inmates within 60 days uh, within the a timely time frame. But we also added at the end, you also added at the end that it requires that the Department of Corrections reimburse regional jails for the actual cost incurred to house eligible inmates. On page eight, which is now section W, sales tax on food for home consumption. There's a final, there's a second sentence added, which reads, however, if there is a reduction or elimination of the sales tax on food for home consumption, grocery tax, then there must be a replacement of lost revenues to localities. And finally, on page 10, which is under section Y, cannabis legislation implementation, line 389 and 390, a sentence was added Notwithstanding the foregoing, a majority of members of city council do not support legislation of marijuana for recreational use. Are there any questions for Ms. Beauregard? This is Brenda Mead. Uh, Ms. Mead. Beauregard, did you say we don't support legislation of marijuana yeah. or legalization? legalization? I'm sorry, did I read that wrong? Yeah. Yes, right. That's okay, I just wanted to make sure that- oh, I, uh, I read it wrong, it says no. legalization. Okay, just yes, want to make sure, thank you. Are there any additional questions or comments? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. I move the city council adopt the resolution establishing the city of Stanton's 2022 legislation, legislative program. We have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? I'll second. Terry Holmes. Councillor Holmes is second. Any further discussion? This is Brenda Mead. Councillor Mead. Thank you. Uh, I, I want to make sure folks uh, on, on this issue of voting hours and uh, expanded voting. This is not city council saying that we want to step back from the current expanded voting hours that have allowed citizens to vote for a period of, I think, 45 days uh, and that uh, vote, voting take place uh, earlier and later. Th that is not what we are proposing here. So 
Um, and then the second thing is that I want to make sure folks understand with respect to this grocery tax issue that should the governor or should the General Assembly uh, pass a, uh, a, a grocery tax reduction or elimination uh, without uh, making uh, cities and counties whole, it would cost the city of Stanton $1.8 million of annual revenue. That uh, equates to about eight cents on your property tax. So it, it is extremely important uh, that you understand that should this grocery tax elimination uh, pass without uh, uh, making uh, the city whole, we will be looking for $1.8 million of expense reductions that, that could be in jobs, uh, very likely could be in jobs since that's one of our major expenditures, uh, but it might also affect other city services. And so that's why it's very important that this, uh, if this uh, tax is eliminated, that we be uh, made whole. Thank you. Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. And, and to further clarify, Ms. Mead, even further is to my knowledge, the governor elect is making that uh, recommendation, but for one year only. This is not, to my knowledge, going to be an ongoing thing year after year after year. And, and thank you for that clarification. And when when I actually see that proposed legislation uh, uh, as as it's proposed, I will be more comfortable. But so far, uh, you know, I, I just don't want to operate on rumor. So, uh, so I think it's important that we keep this language in the proposed legislation. All right. Any further discussion? Ms. Smith, please call the roll. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mayor Aye. Oaks. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Dull. Aye. Motion carries. All right. Thank you. The next item is item B, a discussion of the city's 2022 legislative program with Delegate John Avoli. Delegate Avoli, thank you for joining the Stanton City Council tonight. We appreciate the fact that you've taken time out of your busy schedule to go over our legislative proposals. Um, we um, certainly miss your colleague, uh, Senator Emmett Hanger, but we are very pleased to have you here. I would like to uh, just read through some um, highlighted areas that we um, have recently changed and would like to focus on, which might make the discussion flow a little easier. So if you can bear with me. The plan for our time this evening is not to talk about or mention every single item in the program, but to cover some broad themes, especially new items that are included. The 2022 legislative program reflects both previous priorities that have not been addressed by the General Assembly, but are also important as ever. The new priorities that the City Council have identified as needing attention at this time. A theme we recognize and want to acknowledge during last year's session was the infusion of CARES funding into many important areas, such as education, libraries, state parks, and broadband expansion. These funds are greatly appreciated, but these areas also deserve ongoing and recruiting funding streams. Number one, under the section education, while the city appreciates the CARES funding that we are infused into the preschool program and school HVAC renovations, the General Assembly should fully fund public education, including all mandated programs, the Virginia Preschool Initiative, standards of quality funding, construction and renovation funding, and provide for flexibility in the use of those funds to meet unique local needs. Number two, a new item in this section asks the General Assembly to reinstate the requirement that school principals alert law enforcement of the following misdemeanor offenses when they occur on school property, alleged sexual battery, stalking, violation of protective order, and violent threats. Number three, City Council appreciates the General Assembly's establishment of the Opioid Abatement Authority in 2021 and supports any efforts to curb opioid use and abuse, including additional state programs that partner with local governments to deal with the 
effects of this continuing epidemic. Number four, you didn't know you're gonna be here all night, did you, John? <laughs> As far as criminal justice reform, city council requests that the General Assembly place greater emphasis on the overall reduction of our incarcerated population through criminal justice reform, which will reduce overcrowding and the need to expand jails. Staffing continues to be an issue at the Middle River Regional Jail and council asks the General Assembly to fully fund required staffing positions. Secondly is the issue of the timely transfer of state inmates to the Virginia Department of Corrections. The city requests that the General Assembly enact legislation which more strongly requires the director to timely accept state responsibility inmates and requires the Department of Corrections to reimburse regional jails for the actual cost incurred to house eligible inmates. Number six, a new item in this year's program is asking the General Assembly to reduce or eliminate the sales tax on food for home consumption to assist in dealing with food insecurities in our community. However, if there is an elimination of the sales tax on food for home consumption, then there must be a replacement of lost revenues to localities. Number seven, finally, as part, of, as part of the cannabis legislation implementation, while the majority of this city council does not support legalization of recreational marijuana, city council supports smart implementation of legislation related to medical cannabis to include participation and input by local governments regarding rules and regulations and funding and training and applicable personnel. On behalf of City Council and the citizens of Stanton, I want to thank you for representing the interest of our community and region. We will certainly stay in touch during and after the legislative um, session and now welcome a discussion with you about the city's priorities and your priorities you hope to carry with you this session. So again, welcome Delegate Avoli, and we appreciate the fact that you're willing to address these different issues. Um, I would like to go ahead and just open up the floor. Um, Delegate Avoli, if you would like to address any one of the seven um, points of interest that I read, if you'd like to start off that away, and then if council members want to chime in and ask questions. First of all, um, Senator Hanger sends his regrets. Uh, we were at Augusta Hospital for their legislative priorities. So uh, Emma sent me here and, and he is representing uh, the crew at Augusta Health. I was there until seven o'clock and left. So uh, they, they do a good job and uh, especially with the distribution of the vaccine. And uh, they're having some issues there that they need to be addressed also under mental health and, and public health also. Um, my priorities, uh, Mayor Oaks, uh, are, are um, really addressed here because every one of these issues you've addressed I serve, these are my committees. Uh, I serve on the transportation committee, if I can address that first of all for everyone. Uh, the transportation committee uh, dealing with I-81, there's been enough uh, money now accumulated that sometime uh, next fall, uh, the beginning of the, uh, what we call the tight spots or the dangerous spots in 81 will begin. And basically there will be the three lane operations, much like you have that's been done in Lexington. And if you go to Christiansburg, going to Virginia Tech, you will see on the hills going up to three lanes to it. It'll begin here in Stanton with the, the closure of the Barterbrook uh, Bridge. Uh, that is an impediment because it cannot be expanded. So it's gonna be a brand new bridge. And at the uh, Frontier Culture Museum on 81 and 64, you will see a three lane operation going through there. Uh, going north uh, around the worst cave area where you have a lot of inclines and declines, which is a really, really dangerous area. You will also see a three lane operation, uh, Mount Crawford. And then lastly, the gorilla is putting an additional lane through uh, James Madison University on 81. It will, that'll be a real challenge for VDOT. Everything in between is relatively flat and it will be addressed at some later point. So 81 uh, continues to be a priority for me and to make sure that the money that you've been paying on in taxes will continue to support that. And right now it's on schedule to do so. Uh, under HWI, my other committee, Health, Education and um, uh, Health uh, Welfare and Institutions, 
um, the crisis that we have, folks, uh, with uh, mental health in the Commonwealth of Virginia with methamphetamine opiates is at a critical stage right now. Uh, and, and as I've been told and I've said many times, we are not going to be able to jail ourselves out of this issue. Uh, these are people that are sick, they're ill, and they need help. Uh, they're not criminals, they need help, extensive help. And yet we have uh, very, very limited crisis intervention programs for them. Uh, which need to be addressed. Uh, also, uh, when we look at mental health at our Western State Hospital, uh, the issue of compensation for uh, LPNs, RNs, and as well as security people. Uh, you know, you can go across the street at 15 bucks an hour at Chick-fil-A and at our, our hospital for, for uh, AIDS and et cetera, they're 11 bucks. So people are just not there. That's why they are understaffed at the point. And that's why also you're in a condition right now where you just don't have uh, the staff to sustain the 400 and some 80 beds. That's gonna be addressed and it's gonna require a heck of a lot of money to deal with that. Uh, that is critical, a really critical element for, for what we look at our area here. And uh, this crisis of, uh, of, um, of methamphetamine and opiates and everything else, is a really, really critical issue right here. Uh, under education, uh, that is, uh, as you know, uh, I call myself a recovering principal uh, for many, many years. Uh, uh, one of the initiatives that I fully supported and also voted for the governor's budget twice as a Republican, uh, my initial intent was, uh, and I applauded uh, the first lady uh, to deal with um, early childhood intervention, which is uh, really critical. Uh, I often said many times that as a high school principal, without this early childhood intervention, at a very early age, along with parents, uh, old John Avoli and, and my staff uh, at the age of 16 or 17, uh, it was band-aid time. Uh, a lot of these kids have had monumental problems that it's hard to resolve. And I'm always in favor 100% of dealing with early childhood prevention and intervention as opposed to waiting until there's a critical, uh, a critical need that we have to deal with. So that is a real, real uh, emphasis for that. Um, the, uh, the other component that you said about reporting for principals, um, uh, my, my colleague, uh, uh, Delegate Mullen, out of the Virginia Beach area, produces legislation. And uh, I argue with him. I said, look, Delegate Mullen, you probably never set foot in a classroom. I've been a principal. Please don't put these people in this position. They do not be put in this position. They have too much stuff on their plate. If this occurs, they need to be reported. But we lost the argument on it. And all of a sudden, this stuff is going on right now that is terrible. I think the high school principals uh, should be required, must be required to produce and report uh, these infractions. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Uh, if if your if your daughter or son gets roped on on the street, you report. If it's in a high school, okay, it's up to whoever. It, it just doesn't make any sense. The legislation was not a good piece of legislation. So that's one that's going to be addressed. I think, um, yeah, your your critical uh, race uh, theory that's that's been in the news uh, up in Northern Virginia as part of the governor's uh, election and is. Uh, uh, campaign speech about education is going to be addressed, uh, no question about it. Uh, the transgender education, uh, other than that, it's going to be another one that's going to be dealt with. And funding. Now, uh, the governor's, uh, at this point, um, Mayor Oaks and members of council and members of the audience has uh, remained committed uh, to enhancement of, of public education. Uh, I've ventured to see, and I met with um, our, our school superintendent and the finance director, um, uh, just uh, the other day, and uh, we had a lot of discussion us on funding. Uh, one of the issues that may come about charter schools, uh, number one, uh, your continuance of um, uh, dealing with um, uh, your homeschoolers, and the voucher system, basically uh, taking away from public education and putting that into the hands of parents in the private sector. So uh, anticipation of that coming along is probably going to be there. Uh, the other critical element that I warn, and uh, the, you are last of, uh, of my five jurisdictions that I've met with, and uh, congratulations, your, your line item is 427 lines. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone else in about 20 or 30, but uh, yeah. I appreciate <laughs> where you all have been on there. Uh, but the, the COVID Act money is, uh, is a strange anomaly that's occurred in Virginia throughout country. Uh, I, I urge everyone and all the municipalities that I've dealt with, you all realize that this is one-time money. One-time money, meaning that it's not going to be there next year or the year after or the year after. So if you put this into salaries and reoccurring expenses, you're going to be in trouble down the road. 
this money is in a bucket or should be in a bucket, in my opinion, at least, to deal with capital projects of one time. It's kind of like you're receiving a bonus in your workplace. You can't count on that as a reoccurring because you not may get a bonus next year. It's one-time expenses. Please be aware of that as you begin to produce your budget for next year. It's critical that we understand where we are in the Commonwealth. Uh, this money came through the federal governments there, and all of a sudden we're infusing an awful lot of this money coming into the coffers, but it's one-time money. And I repeat that over and over again to all of you as members of council and mayors and vice mayors and financial directors, city managers and county administrators. Uh, it may not be there next year. More than likely, it will not be there next year. And that's a critical element that you need to deal with. So uh, those are some of the issues that we're dealing with. As you know, at this point, um, the, uh, the House, which I'm a member of, and by the way, for all of you to know, uh, this coming year will be the 403rd meeting of the oldest living uh, Democratic Republic in, in the Western Hemisphere, uh, where Jefferson walked the Madison, et cetera. And for me, uh, and for me, folks, I can tell you, uh, sitting here for 16 years where Mayor Oaks is now, and uh, coming as a little boy from Italy, uh, not speaking a word of English, as I sat there my first year, my first day in that assembly, I, I choked and I could not speak and I had tears in my eyes to think that in this country, uh, this can happen to me. And as I sit here where Jefferson walked and, uh, and I can tell you, it can only happen in America. And, and that is, that is a, a really, a really uh, uh, heartfelt emotion for me that occurred in that, in that time when we worked there. So uh, what I was alluding to at this point, although the, uh, the House, Mayor Oaks and members of council has flipped, uh, we are now at 52 to 48. Uh, the, uh, the Senate still has uh, a two Senate member majority. So a lot of these things that we're talking about in the campaign, it is uh, campaign rhetoric, uh, but at the point when legislation occurs and is delivered, uh, two things need to occur. First of all, it needs to come out of the House on our side, it needs to come out of the Senate, and then both chambers need to agree. Although it comes out of the House, majority of 52 to 48 doesn't necessarily mean it'll come out of the Senate. So a lot of this may be rhetoric and maybe a lot of talk. Uh, if a couple senators jump and do what we want to do on our side, et cetera, then it may happen. Otherwise, uh, it is a check and balance, by the way, which uh, we did not have the last two years. And I truly believe that check and balance in our government is a good thing, not a bad thing. So uh, that's where we are right now uh, in terms of what's happening in Richmond with everything that we we're doing right now. Uh, the marijuana legalization, um, I think would have been more well received um, uh, than what it is right now. And um, I ended up voting against us for the following reason. And I'll relate what the reason to you is. Um, the legislation was to go into effect when it enacted uh, in a planning cycle for two or three years to get everything set. Who's gonna sell it, how, what, where, like you would in a normal business plan. Unfortunately, the governor, for whatever reason, put it into emergency legislation, which went into effect July 1 without a plan. Now, we have people growing marijuana for recreational use. And, uh, you know, I can tell you uh, horror stories with it right now. Uh, the black market is profuse, it's profound. How we're going to compete with it, I have no idea. But you're growing this stuff at home and you're selling, do what you want to do. And it's, it's, it was, a, the plan was ill-conceived, Ill not because of the legislation and the passage of it, but because of the implementation of the program itself. It takes a long time to do this stuff. Uh, who, what, when, and where. Where the store is going to be, who's going to get them, that the procurement issues that are going on. So uh, that's what, one of the reasons I voted against it. I'm fully supportive of uh, the medical use of it. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, I use some of it on my knee myself, and it does work very, very well, believe it or not. It beats a leave and other stuff. So it's, uh, it, it works very well for the me medical use of it. Uh, so these are some of the things that are going on in the General Assembly. We go into session this year on um, the 12th of uh, January, the inauguration, which is a uh, Wednesday, the inauguration of uh, Governor Yunkin and uh, Lieutenant Governor Sears and A.G. Uh, Myers will be on the 15th Saturday. And uh, we come out of session on the 12th uh, of March. This is the long session. So there's a lot of items on there. The crossover, which means that legislation from the Senate to the House occurs uh, the middle of the road, probably at the end of the uh, uh, middle of February sometime, where we cross over and send our stuff to their stuff. <coughs> I will also tell you this, that coming from local government, 
uh, it's been a, a really interesting situation. In the last uh, two years, uh, your General Assembly, 100 delegates and uh, 40 senators, have passed uh, no less than about 2,500 pieces of new legislation. If you ask this delegate, do I know them all? I will say no. I know what my committees are. I could tell you what we passed in transportation, what we passed in health, welfare, and institutions, what we passed in education, but the other 10 committees, I'm sorry. How do you disseminate that number of legislative pieces to nine and a half million Virginians? It's almost impossible. But I hope we don't get to that point uh, this year that we uh, have uh, some legitimacy in what we do and what we don't do. And uh, I know from the future speaker, uh, Todd Gilbert, Madam uh, Oaks and uh, Mayor Oaks, uh, that there is a commitment on our, uh, at least our majority in the house that uh, we will conduct our business orderly. We'll conduct our business with the highest degree of integrity and respect to all. Uh, that's, uh, I'd be glad to answer any question or enter any kind of conversation that you like. Right. Are there any questions from council members? Mayor Oaks, this is Brenda Mead. Councilor Mead. Uh, uh, Ms. Rivoli, uh, it's come to our attention recently that you have another legislative priority uh, in the next session that will impact uh, both Stanton and Augusta County. Uh, and of course, I'm referring to the special legislation that you intend to propose uh, that would move up the date of a second referendum on the relocation of Augusta County's courthouse operations to move that date from 2026 to 2022. Um, I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, your rationale for proposing uh, this uh, Augusta County's requested legislation. And then I'd also like to know uh, from you, uh, if Stanton does not agree to support Augusta County's uh, legislation to accelerate the date of the courthouse, do you intend to propose it anyway? Okay, um, good question. Uh, I'm glad I was anticipating that coming, but uh, I will say this to you, uh, Ms. Mead, maybe before your time, uh, Council Member Mead, uh, that you weren't here, but as I sat where Mayor Oaks sits right now, uh, if you remember the cartoonist in town with a news leader, Jim McCluskey, I don't remember Jim McCluskey. Well, Jim McCluskey, my time, did uh, 16 cartoons on me as mayor of the city of San. And probably my favorite one is the one that I had a noose hanging on Beverly Street with Colonel Frank Pancake holding the noose. You know what that was about, uh, Miss Mead? That was about my support for moving and closing King's Daughters Hospital and moving to the current location. And on behalf of, uh, of uh, Colonel Pancake, uh, uh, when that occurred and that hospital was built, uh, he was man enough and Colonel enough as he was a friend that he invited me to lunch and apologize and said that was the right decision, okay? So to answer your question, uh, this is not John Avoli's legislation. As a member of the General Assembly, this legislation is Augusta County's legislation. And prior to that, it was a city of a Stanton's legislation. I was asked to intervene and do this. Uh, let me make it perfectly clear, okay? That's where we are. Now, my opinion, personal opinion, as uh, the former mayor and sitting in this seat, I think at this point in time, when we look at the future, 20 years down the road, that Augusta County should move the courthouse to Verona. Bottom line to it. It's not feasible, in my opinion, to restore that building and do the function that will need to be done in the next 20 or 30 years in the current location. It's got safety issues. It's got issues galore all the way down the line. So Augusta has asked me to introduce legislation. And by the way, uh, Senator Hanger will produce it on the Senate side. Uh, I think the legislation prior to that that was proposed to negate uh, the, uh, the will of the people in a referendum uh, and not listen, uh, probably was not a good thing and it was ill-conceived. However, uh, let's give the voice again and shorten the length of the uh, referendum and bring it on to fruition. Let the county voters uh, vote on it again and it will be, uh, if it passes, obviously two thirds majority needs to be done and they can vote on it again in November. Uh, let me make it perfectly clear. This courthouse is county property. It sits in the city limits. This is Augusta County's call, not the city of Stanton's call. And these are my constituents also. Uh, and I support, and I've always supported the city of Stanton. This is my home. However, I need to look at the future and the holistic approach to what 
needs to be done with that courthouse. And I really sincerely believe that it could be used something better than uh, coming in there and have prisoners coming into the court in shackles and not producing anything. It's tax exempt right now. Uh, there's no tax to gain from it. It may be a liability to the city under the current conditions. Uh, I oh, hope I answered your question. Well, just uh, uh, just more directly, regardless of whether the city of Stanton supports Augusta County's uh, legislative request, you will, uh, you intend to support it and pr you propose it and support it, author it, sponsor it, and, and Senator Hanger, and I don't want you to have to speak for him, but I'm assuming you've had conversations. Senator Hanger is of the same mind. Uh, that That is my, yes, I will sponsor the legislation and I would hope, uh, Council Mead, between now and the time that this occurs, it's approximately a year that the city of Stanton does some due diligence and does an analysis on the five billings that are proposed to be given to you for $1 a piece of $5, to see whether they're feasible to do and what the usages are. And at that point, I hope you will say yes or no. So, so you're, you're suggesting that we wait until after the referendum, um, because that's not our understanding uh, as we discuss this, and perhaps you haven't seen the MOU. I've but, not seen the MOU, no ma'am. Uh, matter of fact, uh, this is the first time I've seen your legislative priorities also. Uh, if, uh, uh, this is brand new to me. I've not seen it. Okay, so Augusta County is asking that we, at this night, on this night, that we enter into this MOU, and our quid pro quo, if you will, is to receive these five properties at a cost of a dollar each. Right. Um, but our understanding is that they will take that offer off the table if we do not enter into this or agree to enter into this MOU tonight. Uh, Councilman Mead, I've not seen the MOU, so I, I take you for your word on that. I've not seen it, so I don't know. But it will be logical to me, if that's the case, that uh, hopefully analysis will be done whether there is a need for the city. Uh, I would think it just superficially seeing, I've been in uh, on, the, on the Johnson Street one of it, that thing is built like a, a a brick house. I would think there'd be some use. Uh, the courthouse itself could it be used. I, I don't know. Uh, but obviously, in a year's time, uh, there should be some thought, uh, some due diligence to see whether the city really needs those buildings or not. Mm -hmm. Thank you for responding. Yes, ma'am. Are there any additional questions or comments? Delegate Avoli, you had mentioned that uh, we are the fifth. Um, body of government that you've met with concerning the uh -huh. legislative proposals. Um, and you mentioned that the other uh, governmental bodies, the uh, the list that they've given you is much shorter than what we have presented. Uh, yes. Okay. All right. Um, this is very thorough, by the way. Yeah, well, very thank you. Yes. Thank you. And well done. Uh, have the other localities um, approved the VML legislative proposals and then present it to you just um, a couple of particular um, interest points? Yeah, uh, Mayor Oaks, yes. Uh, your, your commonality is here, okay? There's not much difference between um, Howland County, uh, Nelson County, uh, what they're proposing, uh, the city of Waynesboro, Augusta, and of course Stanton here. Uh, the big concerns are dealing with uh, the elimination of food tax uh, and how it impacts. And uh, I remember uh, Mayor Oaks sitting there when Jim Gilmore got elected. Do you remember the no car tax? It was a real impediment on local government. Uh, the car tax uh, uh, that local governments used, uh, it was a user fee. Uh, obviously, uh, people who drove cars uh, paid it. Uh, if you didn't drive a car, you didn't pay it. If you, if you drove a car, then it stands to reason that your city is going to have to pave the street fix sidewalks and uh, et cetera, clean snow. Uh, that's what they're used for. So how do you replace it? And at this point, uh, it, it's a real question mark. It's, it's almost uh, three some, uh, close to three some billion dollars uh, that uh, don't know how you all as local governments are gonna make up for it. That, that, that was a big one. That was a real big one. And again, uh, stressing to the localities, uh, Mayor Oaks, uh, uh, remember that this uh, CARES Act, COVID relief money, is one time money and Certainly. please be careful use it for capital expenses 
and not reoccurring expenses because it may not be there next year. Okay. Hear that, Ms. Beauregard? <laughs> She's in charge of our absolutely CARES funding. I think she knows. I don't need to tell yeah. her. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, Here, ex Councillor Darby. Delegate Willie, um, quickly, could you just, any news on the redistricting, where, where things are with that? Well, the latest map came out last night late. And uh, uh, it, again, it's, uh, it's out there, uh, but there's a lot of tweaking uh, that may need to be done. Uh, the 20th district, uh, which is where we are right now, which uh, compromises uh, my district of Highland County, uh, Stanton, Waynesboro, a portion of Augusta, and then half of Nelson, uh, will be uh, quite different, uh, meaning that according to what came out last night, I will continue to have Stanton and Waynesboro. I will have uh, a good majority of South uh, East Augusta County, the Sturshraft area, the Greenville area, all the way to Rockbridge County, excluding uh, Buena Vista and Lexington. And uh, I will lose Highland County and, and uh, Nelson County. Uh, but that's proposed. Uh, it's still not set in stone, but that's what's out there right now. So uh, whoever's in this district, it'll be called the 36th district, by the way, not the 20th. Uh, it'll be a name change. And of course, these occur every 10 years. So you'll be stuck with this thing uh, for another another 10 years with the district occurs. But again, it's proposed, not set in stone. Thank you. Anything else? This is Brenda Mead. I just wanted to add uh, and thank you, um, Delegate Avoli, for mentioning the redistricting issue. Uh, that uh, redistricting map is now available to the public uh, and the public has the opportunity to make comments. Uh, uh, Delegate Avoli, can you tell me for what period of time the public comment is open? Oh, shoot. I wish I, 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 I can send it to you, but I don't have it off the top of my head. Okay. Well, that, I mean, it would be important to note that for some period of time, the public has the ability to review those maps and to Absolutely. make comments. And Absolutely. this would be a very good time for you to do that. So thank you. Uh, Mayor Osa, one yes. last comment. And I think, uh, um, uh, Council uh, Member Mead uh, alluded to it, and uh, very dear to my heart. Uh, I don't know whether Council Mead and, and you all are aware of it, but Augusta County um, uh, last year received a $600,000 grant. It's called uh, Diversion uh, in lieu of incarceration. And uh, 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 Tim Martin, the Commonwealth Attorney, appointed me to his board, uh, which has done marvelous work. And basically, it's for uh, first time or maybe even second time offenders for petty stuff. Um, if you agree to X, Y, and Z, you report to X, Y, and Z daily and you do community service, you don't go to court that's not on your record. And that doggone program has been really, really good. And it reduces incarceration and it, uh, it alleviates some of the issues with maybe some of the dumb things that we did at our young time <laughs> when we were kids ourselves. Uh, but that's been very successful. It's reduced some of the rate. Um, uh, the other thing that we're working on now is uh, all of you know with the Middle River uh, Regional Jail, they asked me last year to put in a budget amendment uh, up to almost $25 million for the expansion of the jail. Uh, I think that is going to be a foregone conclusion. It's not going to happen. Uh, we hope to divert some of that money for a planning grant uh, to look at a crisis intervention center. I think it's uh, worth more of this money than incarceration, uh, what's occurring at the point. So that's going very, very well. And we hope to, at some point with the board, uh, at some time it will extend this offer to the city of Stanton and Waynesboro to include uh, this diversion program that is working very, very nicely right now. Um, would that include the drug court? The drug court is including it, yes. Okay. It's, it, it's, it's separate, but it's part of it. Exactly. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And this is Brenda Mead again, and thank you for raising that. Delegate of Oli, I, I do want to note that the uh, that Augusta County's program has uh, has been uh, successful. Um, it, the proportion of uh, people of color uh, that are being uh, given access to that program and have gone through the program is not sufficient. It doesn't represent the population of incarcerated people. So, as we get the opportunity in Stanton to put that kind of program in place, I would hope we would ensure that uh, we are paying attention to the fact that our minority population is, uh, is represented uh, in, our, in our jails and prisons at a higher rate uh, than, than uh, white people. And 
uh, we need to make sure they have the same opportunities for rehabilitation. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. All right. Anything else? Well, again, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. And we appreciate everything that you do for the city of Stanton. Good job. Thank you, John. Thank, thank you. you. If you'd like to stay for the rest of the meeting, feel free. But if you have other things to do, we understand. I hope I don't have other things to do tonight. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that takes us on to item C, public hearing and consideration of a request by Lane Arbor LLC to rezone 914 Middlebrook Avenue from R2 low density residential district and R4 high density residential district to R4 high density residential district conditional. Mr. Rosenberg. Madam Mayor, Rodney Rhodes, the city senior planner will present this item. All right, welcome Mr. Rhodes. Thank you, Madam Mayor Oaks, City Council members. Lane Arbor LLC has applied for rezoning of 914 Millbrook Avenue. The property consists of approximately 24 acres and is at the intersection of Middlebrook Avenue and Moore Streets. Uh, most of this property was annexed into the city in 1948 and has been utilized um, as pasture um, and growing hay on it over the past 70 plus years. I think I do have a couple slides on this. Yep, right and to get to this full screen. On the bottom to the right, you see a little thing that looks like a projector on the PowerPoint section. On the, okay, see ya. Thank you. Oh, it's oh. down here. Oh, the screen. Yeah, I was like, what? That'll work. That'll All right. Thank you. <laughs> it's a team effort. Um, if you can see this, this is uh, Millbrook out here, uh, Moore Street um, that comes down the side of the property. At this point, it's a very narrow um, road up in this section. Uh, Lacey B. King is across the street from it to give you some context. Um, I have admired this old barn on the building for years as I drive by. Um, and I'm sorry. Um, use the arrows at the bottom, Rodney, or uh, use that's your the best way to do it on your keyboard. Thank you. Uh, the request is to rezone it to um, R4 high density residential district conditional. Currently, about three quarters of the property is zoned R4 high density uh, residential district, about 18 of the 24 acres. Um, this back portion that's in yellow is low density residential, as is the surrounding area. Um, the applicant has um, uh, proposed a condition that there would be no more than 200 total dwelling units on this property, on the total 24 acres. Um, this property may be very familiar to council because back in March, uh, the uh, contract purchaser, Middlebrook Trace Virginia LLC, came before the city uh, requesting support of several um, items that improved or uh, their scoring of their application to the Virginia Housing Development Authority for tax credits. And this past uh, uh, June, they were approved for those tax credits. And they have submitted a site plan. This is one page of the initial site plan. I think this was actually part of the landscape plan showing the proposed development of that phase one, which includes 82 low to moderate income units. Um, anyone that's familiar with this property would know that there is, it's basically a valley um, down the middle of this. Um, it's got some very steep slopes. And because of that, the applicant is requesting that the back portion of the property, and I'll go back, um, so basically move the density to the back of the property for this phase two. Uh, back there, it's, the slopes are not as severe. It's my understanding that they will do some cut and fill and cut some of that area and fill um, the area for phase one. 
Um, once again, the applicant has proposed limiting the density to no more than 200 units. Under the current zoning, um, zoning would support uh, over 1,000 units on this property. Now, I'm not going to say that 1,000 units could fit on this property because a lot of factors go into that. You know, open space, there need to be 2,000 parking spaces. Um, um, so there's a lot of factors that go into that. But currently, that portion of zone R4 could have over 1,000 units. And the portion that's in yellow, the low density, could have 32 single-family dwellings on that section. Um, the applicant has also proffered that um, the sole access to this property would be at the front over there near Middlebrook, um, as it's shown in this initial site plan for phase one. So this would continue on to the back of the property to serve um, phase two. Therefore, there should not be traffic coming out onto this upper portion of Moore Street, which is very narrow. Also, they said, uh, proffered that there would be emergency access in the back, you know, for fire rescue and also uh, for pedestrians to get from one um, side of the property to the other. Um, city staff has reviewed the application and has noted that city water and sewer infrastructure may need to be upgraded to provide adequate service and fire flow. That would be addressed during the site plan um, review process and that would be at the um, developer's cost to make those upgrades. And there could be some benefits to the adjoining property owners if that is upgraded in that area, the water and sewer. Uh, the comprehensive plan designates this as low density residential, which is normally detached single family homes with uh, density up to five units per acre. Obviously what's being proposed does not meet that, far exceeds that, however, as you just heard, um, currently that there could be over a thousand units under the current zoning. Therefore, this proposed rezoning is closer to what the comp plan calls for uh, for this area. Plan Commission conducted a public hearing on this on November 18th. Uh, and at that meeting, one person spoke on the need to integrate bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure and in projects such as this one. And three people from the surrounding neighborhood um, noted their concerns about additional traffic on the narrow section of Moore Street. I think if I had this display, um, we could have alleviated some of those concerns. We certainly tried to do that during the meeting that one of the proffers was traffic is going out this way, not on the upper section of Moore Street. And at, at the conclusion of that public hearing, uh, the Planning Commission voted four to one to recommend approval of the conditional rezoning. I'd be glad to take any questions you have at this time or after you conduct a public hearing. I would note that Ray Burkholder of Balzer Associates is representing the applicant and he may be able to better answer any technical questions you may have. Um, if he could come up to the podium, that would be great. Does the um, city council have any questions at this time? This is Brenda Mead. Councilor Mead. Thank you. Um, uh, how does an emergency access uh, differ from a road coming into a property? Normally, uh, there would be a gate and a lock um, for emergency access, and fire and rescue would have access to a key to open that. So it would not be open to the general public. Okay. And then... Um, so I, my, I, as I understand the proposal, there will be no single family residences on the property that it, they, it will be, when, when you talk about a housing unit and a, an apartment is a housing unit. So that means there are gonna be 200 apartments. Uh, that is correct. Uh, the phase one has 82. So there could be a potential of up to 118 units in the back of the property. Okay. Thank you. Would you care to address the council? Happy to. Uh, Ray Brickle with Balzer and Associates. Uh, the only thing I'll add to that on the water pressure, and I, I know uh, Lyle Moffitt's here with City Engineering. He could speak to this as well, but uh, we, we are already improving the water loop line in the first phase, bringing a much larger line in. 
currently up in the neighborhood there. There's a lot of small lines, six, four, two inch lines. So we'll have a eight inch line coming off the 12 inch down on Middlebrook Avenue and then, and then bring that up through the first phase. That'll then continue into the second phase and can loop back into the neighborhood and, and, and support that. Um, so that will we'll in increase water pressures throughout the whole community there. Um, again, really just trying to begin planning for the second phase. So this is kind of the first step of that. Uh, we did ask for 200 units. Um, likely, you know, we might get to 160, but again, not knowing what may come and, and we're, we're facing, I was telling Rodney as before the meeting, we're facing the same challenges as everybody, affordable housing, and we're seeing 30% increases in materials happening come January 1. And so it's just, it's just a continued effort to try to provide affordable housing and uh, it's just a challenge. So something we continue to look at and it continues to change how we, how we model and plan houses. So uh, happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Well, Councillor Holmes? I just can't imagine adding that many um, apartments and, and, and not causing some traffic issues in that area. I, would, I mean, that's a, not a, a really wide road. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a wide road where we're connecting. So it's an improved, Morris, uh, Morris Street is improved all the way down to the second bend there. And then it really necks down. So there's no reason for folks to go back into the neighborhood. They're gonna come out right to Middlebrook Avenue. Uh, we've looked at and submitted a traffic uh, turn lane analysis for engineering. Uh, it's Middlebrook with the bypass is really underutilized uh, the way it used to be. So. There's quite a bit of capacity in Middlebrook Avenue. Um, people kind of trickle out at different times too. And so it's just not as, not as much as you might think. Um, and the bus, bus service won't come all the way up that. It, um, it currently does not. Um, there'd be a desire to have that for sure. So that's something they'll work with them to try to get. Uh, this is uh, Brenda Mead again, if you don't mind. Um, what, uh, what, uh, how are you addressing the uh, request from a community member about uh, bike and pedestrian uh, accommodation? And uh, will that include um, somehow improving the exit from the, the apartment complex and access for people to uh, take Middlebrook Avenue into town from that point? Um, because I think right now uh, there really is no pedestrian walkway there's a it's not even a curb I don't think it's just a shoulder correct on Middlebrook Avenue there's just a shoulder we've proffered that we're going to have pedestrian connections down to the entrance uh, how we get people from Morris downtown that's something the city's going to have to address with the improvements plans uh, we'd, we'd love to see that too and and Again, if, if uh, there's a lot of right of way, um, quite a bit of right of way there already. So there's uh, adequate right of way to provide bike or shared use path or something there currently. So um, I think the problem is a, a little further down, probably, you know, as you come off this property and come on down toward the, the signal light, it gets a little tighter. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yep. Mr. Rhodes, did you want to address that matter? Uh, if I could just clarify a couple points, um, I didn't mention in the in the briefing that a um, turn lane analysis was performed um, based on this development on Middlebrook. That um, the conclusion of that report was that was did not need to be a, a special turn lane on Middlebrook into this development. The city engineer reviewed that report and concurred with that conclusion. Um, as far as bicycle and pedestrian um, improvements, as Mr. Burkholder noted, there would be improvements within the development on, um, to get from one end to the other end of the development. Um, our bike ped plan calls for um, bike lanes at some point from that point um, into downtown. There is a significant right away in that area. Right now, there's just a wide shoulder, um, but that would be something the city would need to undertake. All right, anything else, my council members? All right, um, 
We're going to have a public hearing. I first need to read some guidelines, and then after that, I'll bang the gavel. And when I do that, the public hearing will be open. Uh, we're going to alternate between the audience and any um, Zoom callers. If you want to speak for or against it, please come up to the podium or call in, and we'll be happy to listen to what you have to say when I um, bang the gavel a second time. That will close the public hearing out, and I'll entertain a motion. All right, public hearing. In a moment, I will open up the public hearing. It is a time that council sets aside to hear from citizens and others about a specific topic. We ask that you please give your name, your address, and then keep your remarks at five minutes or less. When you reach the five minute time limit, I will let you know that your time limit has expired. For our Zoom participants, please raise your hand now if you wish to speak on this particular public hearing. If you raise your hand during this public hearing, you will also be able to raise your hand during the council meeting for other public hearings and matters of the public. And please keep your, uh, minute, please keep your comments to five minutes as well. Once everyone who wishes to speak has had an opportunity, I will then close the public hearing. I will now open the public hearing, so if you wish to speak, please approach the podium and we'll alternate between individuals physically present and those that have their hands raised via the Zoom platform. With that, the public hearing is now open. Would anyone from the audience like to address the council concerning this matter? Hi, welcome. Good evening. My name is Ingrid Blanton. I'm at 217 North Madison Street. Um, my concern about this proposal is not so much the development itself, but the lack of an attendant um, commitment on the part of the city in regards to the alternative transportation. Um, it's you know really a shame to think of 200 units and no way to get into town except to get into a car. We have in this country, as we know, an epidemic of obesity, um, having ways to get to place from place to place without getting in a car would um, do a great deal towards helping that. So the built community is vital to the, not only character of our community, but the health of our community. And I strongly urge that these kind of developments not be approved unless there is, as I've said, an attendant commitment on the part of the city to provide for proper transportation aside from just cars. So thank you very much. Right. Thank you. All right, Ms. Smith. I forgot to hit, yes. I, and no, there is no one on Zoom with their hand raised. Okay. Would anyone else from the audience care to speak? All right. Well, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yes, sir. Come on up. Evening. Hi. My name is Lane Santor. I live at 818 Moore Street. Has anybody taken in consideration the caverns that join? Uh, 914. The only reason I ask is because when Mr. Evers owned that land, he was filling in that valley. The city stopped him because they were afraid of a cave in. Okay. And nobody has ever been up there. The last meeting that we had, or you all had, uh, they didn't even realize there was taverns there. So I'm just wondering, have we talked about the caverns? All right. Well, thank you. Um, Mr. Rhodes, I guess we can, have you heard about any caverns? <laughs> We have had a preliminary geotechnical report mm -hmm. performed. Uh, we are uh, waiting the resistivity report. So that's where they do ground penetrating radar through the site. So uh, we are investigating that. Um, again, we'll have to have to adjust as we uh, see what we find. So, uh, but nothing was reported in our preliminary geotechnical report. Thank you. All right. Ms. Smith, one more time. Anybody with their hands raised? Well, we um, we have uh, we need to go to Zoom first. 
Uh, there is no one on Zoom with their hands raised. Okay, now I'll go to, yes, yes sir, come on up. Hi, welcome. Oh, thank you. Uh, good evening, I'm Chip Lilly. I'm at 809 Moore Street. I had a concern about the caverns as well. Um, I've known that they've been there for quite some time. Do you know, sir, when uh, you might get that report back? We're just waiting for them to come okay. out. Okay. So, yeah. My concern is I'm, I'm butted up right against this. Uh, I have easements on my property where uh, they've come up with the, the power company just to, to cut off some of our trees and everything. And they've actually formed pretty large uh, sinkholes up on my property. So <clears throat> it's concerned for me. And if you notice going up Moore Street, that that road typically caves in. I've been up there about 20 years and they fix it quite a bit. Uh, I don't want to put houses in there that are going to, you know, with people not knowing that things are going to start coming out from underneath them. All right. I don't want it to affect myself or my neighbors up there as well. So it's it's a concern, and I don't know if you can publish it when you do get those uh, geological surveys done, but I'd appreciate it. So thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, last chance. Anyone else? There is no one on Zoom with their hands raised. All right. Thank no. you. Yes, sir. Come on up. My name is Nathaniel Showalter. I'm at 316 Hayes Avenue. And my question was mostly just for the city manager on whether this will change the agenda for any infrastructure projects in the local area. This particular project won't induce a change. And I uh, will have to look and I don't recall that there's anything currently included in the CIP that's to be proposed to the Planning Commission later this month. Thank you. All right, with that, the public hearing is now closed and I'll entertain a motion. All right, I got it here, got it. I move the council adopt the ordinance and approve the uh, conditional rezoning as recommended by the planning commission. There's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Second. Councillor Clappy has second. Any further discussion? This is Brenda Mead. Councillor Mead. Thank you. I intend to vote in favor of this rezoning, uh, but I do want to add that uh, that uh, we uh, this area has uh, seen an increase in housing, a substantial increase in housing since I moved to Stanton, which was a decade ago. Um, I, I think uh, our plans to uh, put a, a bike lane or bike pedestrian lane uh, should be accelerated uh, for this project and for this street. Um, this would allow folks who live there to travel uh, to downtown Stanton without getting into a car. I think it would be a healthy thing for the neighborhoods uh, for folks to get out as opposed to constantly getting in their cars and going places. So I do hope that as part of this, we think about uh, accelerating our plans for that bike pedestrian access um, as we're thinking about our infrastructure plan, our capital improvement plan for the coming year and our priorities um, as we spend as Delegate Avoli was referring to, the one-time money uh, that the federal government has given us. Any additional questions or comments? Um, Vice Mayor Robertson. I reckon I just want to ask, uh, let's just say this geological report come back and it does find significant caverns or soft areas. Uh, how is that going? Do you have the means to correct that to to bolster it is that going to overall affect because it, it will increase the cost of those buildings is that going to overall affect the cost of uh, the rental or the, uh, the property that uh, citizens would be pop you know buying into you see where i'm going with that right yeah yeah and and so 
again, I can't speak to what I don't don't know at this point, yeah. but having more additional property here, we don't have that boundary will give us greater flexibility in adjusting. Mm -hmm. So we don't impact those areas. Um, we'll, we'll be working with the building department on, on any kind of foundations, all of that type of work. So again, we're going to be using sound engineering practices um, to try to address those. If, you know, if, if we can't just avoid them altogether, that would be the ideal situation. If, we're, if we encounter them, we avoid them. Yeah. Um, uh, there are different ways to, to mitigate. Again, we've got to assess the size and nature of, of what these are. Uh, we are in the valley, so we've run across karst features uh, on many projects. So okay. not something that we're not used to uh, dealing okay. with. So, One thing the city does pride itself on is um, pushing towards being a walkable city right. throughout all of Stanton. So. Yeah, well, as you noted, there's a lot of houses and and apartments there now. So it would, yeah, be a great, great asset. Thank you. All right, Ms. Smith, please call the roll. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Dole. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mayor Opes. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. All right, the next item is item D, a discussion, introduction, and public hearing of ordinance to amend the FY 2022 budget for the city of Stanton by adding budget amendment number three. Mr. Rosenberg. Madam Mayor, uh, Phil Trayer, the city's chief finance officer, will present this item. And then after his presentation, you'll want to entertain a motion to introduce the ordinance and to conduct the public hearing. Thank you. Welcome, Mayor. Mr. Trayer. Thank you, Madam Mayor. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. Tonight, we're here to introduce Budget Amendment Number 3 for FY 2022. Budget Amendment Number 3 is this year's major budget amendment, which captures prior year carryover, grant award true-ups, new grant awards, donations, and insurance recoveries. Budget Amendment Number 3 totals $21,155,000 and does require a public hearing, which is scheduled for this evening. The city portion of the budget amendment equals 15670 The school portion equals 5484 As a comparison, last year's major, major budget amendment equals 12923 Details have been summarized in your packet. It includes the following, 8791 in general fund provisions, including $401,000 for general government, $60,000 for judicial administration, $297,000 for public safety, $562,000 for public works, $243,000 for parks, recreation, and cultural, $335,000 community development, and $6,276,000 transfer to the CIP fund. The CIP fund transfer includes $1,670,000 to fund appropriations for FY 2022 and 2023 CIP projects, a $2.5 million transfer to reserve funds for future school construction projects, $1.6 million for emergency radio project, $331,000 for police and animal control vehicles, and $175,000 for public works vehicles. Moving past CIP, we have $300,000 community development fund, $293,000 for the environmental fund, $10,000 for grant fund, 5,667,000 to the education fund, a $250,000 adjustment to the school CIP, and 67,000 to the school state operating program. The city manager recommends the introduction of this budget amendment as presented and the public hearing, as you know, is scheduled for this evening and was properly advertised. And now for the slides, which hopefully will provide a little clarity. Slide two is a summary of what we outlined above. Total budget amendment equals 21,155. City portion 15,670. 15, the school portion 5,485. On slide three, we begin a breakdown of the budget amendment into categories. On this slide, we've outlined carry forward items, which includes police and fire asset funds, fire program funds, donation from the Lions Club, of $36,000 for the renovation of the duck pond walls at Gypsy Hill Park. 
Slide four should look familiar as these figures appeared in the fund balance presentation presented to council on November 11th, 2021. It includes the CIP funding of $6.3 million as we discussed above. Non-CIP carryovers include a provision for economic development agreements to 275,000, flood damage appropriation of $200,000 to address damage at the duck pond, an increase in safety net reserve by 1%, which equates to $617,000, operating contingency of 375,000, juvenile detention provisions of 125,000 to replace lost federal funds, a $45,000 provision for science to move the sign shop at Public Works, and finally a $25,000 appropriation to enhance cybersecurity software. Slide five is a combination of true ups, grant carryovers, and recognition of additional grants. We start with a $2,772 adjustment of the Clerk of the Courts Technology Trust Funds. We are bringing this appropriation down to match the FY 2022 scheduled reimbursement. We have a $19,377 provision for the Sheriff Department bonus. This was a statewide bonus provided to sheriff's departments and jail employees. The state is covering approximately $16,000 of these costs. We received additional funding in the amount of $29,000 for victim witness program, $22,000 for joint task force funding, U.S. Marshals, a $5,000 award from Bursa, our state insurance carrier, for the Public Works Department to be used for flood lighting. We have a $60,000 appropriation for the tourism grant awarded by the state. And the remaining items is Susan Blakely Grant, Nature Park Reserve, and Booker T. Washington funds that carry over balances from previously approved grants. Slide six, we start with a $508,000 appropriation of carryover funds for State Street maintenance funding. And we have four different insurance recoveries totaling $13,358. Slide seven, community development funds. We received $300,000 HUD grant for revitalization of the West End. And we have an emergency performance grant awarded to the fire department from VDEM in the amount of $7,500 and a $2,600 award to the police department for local law enforcement block grant. Finally, we have three adjustments to the environmental fund, including a $1,700 adjustment to the litter control fund to match expected funding. $75,000 for possible staffing adjustments, which would, which would provide up to three prorated positions to assist with refuse collection. And we have a $220,000 provision for a new refuse truck. That truck will take upwards of two years to receive. Slide eight, outline school appropriations. None of these require any additional city funds. The appropriation includes 5.7 million dollars to the education fund for new grants and federal war carryovers include ESSER two carryover funds of $1.9 million from FY 2021. We have $1.3 million for emergency technology funds, as well as $1.9 million for traditional education funds carryovers, which includes Title I funding and vision grant carryovers. We have $236,000 for donation insurance recoveries a $250,000 transfer from the school CIP to the school general fund. And this was per school request. And we have a $67,000 provision for the school state operating pro programs for grant carryovers and true ups. And finally on slide nine, we have the CIP offset mentioned above. Um, I will be happy to answer any questions that you have at this time. Vice Mayor Robertson. Bill. Yes, sir. Just want to double check um, page or slide four. Okay. You probably know where I'm going with this. Uh, line four, police and animal control vehicle replacement. Okay. Is the animal control vehicle replacement simply for like for like Shane Ayers or whatever, where his department goes out and gets stray dog yes. cats? Yes. Not the other item I was talking yes, about. Yes, sir. Okay. Are there any additional questions? Mr. Treyer, on page seven under the uh, community development fund for the HUD grant funding for new entitlement community program, the 300,000, can you um, just talk a little bit more about that? That's for the revitalization of the West End. Uh, Mr. Vaughn is incorporating that in, into his HUD plan. And uh, I believe that the, we're uh, looking at uh, 
um, some water and sewer issues there on the west side. Uh, Mr. Vaughn can provide some more details and I'll be happy to get that forward to that to council. Thank you. All right, anything else? I'll entertain a motion at this time. Mayor. <laughs> Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. I move to introduce an ordinance amending the fiscal year 2022 budget by adding budget amendment number three, totaling $21,155,122 and that council conduct a public hearing of the ordinance. Right. There's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? A second. Councillor Holmes is second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Smith, please call the roll. Ms. Dull. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Motion carries. All right. Thank you. Now, I'll conduct a public hearing just like before. I'll bang the gavel. If you'd like to come to the microphone to speak for or against, feel free. We'll alternate between the audience and the Zoom callers. And once I bang the gavel a second time, that'll close the public hearing out. With that, the public hearing is now open. Would anyone like to address the council? Right. Ms. Smith, do we have anyone on Zoom? I have no one on Zoom with their hand raised. All right, thank you. Um, Anyone else? All right. With that, the public hearing is now closed. All right. That takes us on to item E, a discussion and consideration of resolution authorizing Virginia Department of Transportation inventory adjustments. Mr. Rosenberg. Madam Mayor, Lyle Hart, our city engineer, will present this item. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council. As part of the development of Frontier Center, VDOT contributed funds for the construction of the Frontier Center Trail and the George M. Cochran Parkway, which effectively replaced a section of old VDOT Route 333 in conjunction with the project. Upon completion of the project, the city is pursuing the addition of these new streets into its urban system as is customary. To accomplish this, VDOT needs city council to adopt the attached resolution. A sketch of the area provided by VDOT is referenced in the resolution and is also attached. And in the, uh, the sketch, you can see the various uh, sections of, of the road that are mentioned there. About 333 is shown in blue, and that's what's being replaced and was abandoned with the project. And then uh, Frontier Center Trail, Georgia M. Cochran Parkway, and the intersection with Augusta Woods Drive is to be added to the urban system. These are shown in the magenta lines. All right, are there any questions? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. I move that city council adopt the proposed resolution authorizing the Virginia Department of Transportation, VDOT, to add those portions of Frontier Center Trail, George M. Co Cochran Parkway, and Augusta Woods Drive as shown on exhibit A to the resolution to the city's local system of roads. All right, we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Madam Mayor, I'll second that. All right. uh, Councillor Claffey is second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Smith, please call the roll. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Ms. Dull. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Motion carries. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, that takes us to item F. If you guys can just hang in there with us. We have a lot of items because we only meet once for the month of December. Item F, a presentation by city auditors on the FY 2021 annual comprehensive financial report. Mr. Rosenberg. Mr. Treyer will present this item. Welcome back, Mr. Treyer. Thanks, Madam Mayor. It's a pleasure to, to be back. Tonight, we are here for our year-end presentation of the FY 2021 Annual Comprehensive Financial Report, ACFR, formerly known as the CAFR. As I'm sure you're aware, in many ways, FY 2021 proved to be just as challenging as FY 2020. While the city and schools were fortunate to have received significant amounts of federal and state support via grants, with it came a significant amount of reporting requirements in interpretation of federal award language 
would seem to change on a weekly basis. Throughout the year and into FY 2022, the city's had the luxury of having been able to draw upon four tremendous financial resources, two internal, Cindy Fitzgerald and Jesse Moyers, and two external, Megan Argenbright and Kristen Holland of Brown Edwards. As most of you know, Cindy Fitzgerald has worked in the finance department for 22 years. No one has a better grasp for our balance sheet or act for than Cindy Fitzgerald. She continues to offer us late nights and weekend work, which are the norm for Cindy. And she remains an absolute pillar of our finance department. Without Cindy's hard work and integrity, tonight's audit presentation may very well have been different. Cindy, thank you for your work. If you could stand for a moment. The other star of the finance department is Jesse Moyers. Jesse's came to us from Mary Baldwin University and has been with us for nearly three years. In FY 2021, Jesse coordinated and managed the EDA small business grants and two rounds of utility relief monies, as well as working on the school's financials. Jesse's hard work has provided the city with the consistent and timely deliverance of the grant funds into the community she supported. Jesse's future is quite bright. And we thank her for all her hard work and consistency. Jesse, if you could stand for a And finally, the other great women who supported us in FY21 and FY22 is Megan Argenbright and Kristen Holland. Once again, Megan and Kristen have made themselves available throughout the CARES Act process in FY2020. 2021 and now into FY 2022. Their willingness to take our many calls to help us vet the CARES Act guidance has been instrumental in ensuring compliance with the ever-changing guidance we have received from federal and state agencies. Both Megan and Kristen and the staff of Brown Edwards have been a true partner in ensuring the city remained on safe place in a changing environment. Kristen is here to report to you and we thank you. Please, thank you. Yours. All right, welcome. <clears throat> Good evening. Good evening. I just want to thank everyone here um, for the opportunity to serve the city. Um, my name is Kristen Holland. I'm an associate at Brown Edwards and Company. I've been uh, had the pleasure of working on the city's audit um, or leading the audit for the past couple years, but this is the first time I'm getting to see you fine folks. So again, thank you for having me. Um, I want to echo what Phil already said and compliment not only city finance, but all of the departments that we had to reach out to during the audit. Um, we realized that they have their own job duties and uh, additional inquiries and requests of us um, take additional time. So we recognize that and we greatly appreciate it. Um, I will start with uh, going over an overview of the annual comprehensive report. Uh, once again, this was prepared by City Finance. Um, again, I, want, I can't compliment Cindy and Jesse enough for the preparation of this report. You know, it's, it's 250 pages. It's very time consuming. And we have less and less clients that are spending the time on that for those reasons. They do an amazing job and I cannot give them enough props for that fact. Um, the first item in the report that I'll direct your attention to is the transmittal letter, and that was prepared by Mr. Phil Trayer. Um, it gives a great non-financial um, overview of some things related to the city. I always do enjoy reading that each year. The next item in the report is the auditor's report. Uh, we did express an unmodified opinion on the financial statement, which is the opinion that you want. Um, basically, it just means that the financial statements are accurate in all material respects. The one thing I do want to point out in this letter, which is on the second page of the letter, is the change in accounting principle, which is in relation to the implementation of GASB 84. Uh, the objective of this standard was to enhance the consistency and comparability of how fiduciary activities are accounted for and presented in the financial statements of local governments. So what does that mean? <laughs> Essentially, the biggest change um, was that the school activity funds were incorporated into this report in the um, school board activities. The school activity funds have always had a separate report. However, GASB 84 essentially required that those are now also recorded in this report. 
Um, if you want some more details, there is um, some additional discussion in note 23. So the essential purpose of this report is to take accounting and financial data and put it into a usable form that people can understand. Um, I'm not gonna go into details into everything specifically, but I will point out the, the next item in the report is the management discussion and analysis. And that's essentially a summary of all of these additional pages behind it um, that puts everything in a little bit better perspective and summarize it, summarizes it really well. So if you do nothing else other than spend your Friday evenings reading this entire report, <laughs> just re go through the, the MDNA as we call it. And it's the only part of the report that has um, comparable information, meaning um, it compares fiscal year 21 to fiscal year 20 and kind of gives some explanation behind um, why the trends happen and why the changes occur. Further back in the report, if you're looking at it starting back on page like 161, there's a section called um, the compliance section. And this again is two other um, letters or opinions, if you will. The first one being the um, government auditing standards, which is just covering internal controls over financial reporting. And then the second one is um, an opinion on compliance for each of the grant programs, and then the internal controls over those programs. Uh, again, we did express an unmodified opinion on those, um, which is what you want. Okay, the next thing I will direct your attention to is the management letter, which is the one that's called um, comments on internal control and suggestions. Um, this part of our audit is that we have to evaluate internal controls and look at the processes behind those controls. Essentially, this letter is a tool for us to communicate um, what we found and suggest areas for improvement. Uh, the first two pages kind of discuss the different types of deficiencies that you can have, and then the following pages are our suggestions. Um, now, there are three types of deficiencies that you can have. But the suggestions that we've had for the city are considered the less severe of those suggestions. So if you're going to have comments, those are the ones that aren't as, you know, as bad. Um, then at the end of the letter is a section called new pronouncements, new accounting pronouncements, which just makes everyone aware that there's some changes coming forward that may require some attention. And finance is well aware of these and has already started making uh, any necessary preparations to account for those. And then the final letter is the communication with the um, charge with governance. And this is a required communication. Um, it's, it's essentially boilerplate, but it is customized to specific city matters. And one of the uh, first things we discuss is sensitive estimates. And those include things like um, the useful life of capital assets, pension and OPEB liabilities, uh, lobby, lot, landfill liabilities, and the self-insurance plan. The next part, we discuss um, sensitive disclosures, which there's some overlap between the estimates and the sensitive disclosures. But the, they would be things like, again, capital assets, long-term debt, pension, and OPEB. The next section is uh, it's titled Corrected and Uncorrected Misstatements. There were no um, audit adjustments in fiscal year 21, so there was no corrected misstatements, if you will. Um, we have one in here for uncorrected misstatements, but essentially management has determined that there, the there was no impact to the users of the financial statements. So we, rather than running that through the prior year as we have listed, um, it was just flowed through the current year. And then at the back of that letter, where it starts with the city letterhead, is the management representation letter. Um, that just essentially is during the audit, management has made certain representations to us. And this is the formal way of them taking responsibility for those representations. And that's all I have. Do you guys have any questions? Are there any questions? All right. Councillor. 
Noel, you do not have any questions as a recovering CPA? I'm, I'm just waiting for the hard copy. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Well, thank you very much. And um, sure. before we move any further, uh, Mr. Treyer, can you come up here? You've recognized everyone else's efforts, so I would like to recognize yours. Thank you for everything thank that you. you've done. I'll entertain a motion. Madam Mayor. Councilor Clappy. I move that City Council accept the fiscal year 2021 annual comprehensive financial report as presented. We have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Mayor Oaks. Councilor Darby. I second. We have a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Smith, please call the roll. Ms. Mead. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Ms. Dull. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Motion carries. All right. Thank you. It takes us on to item G, a discussion and consideration of memorandum of understanding between County of Augusta and City of Stanton concerning Stanton and Augusta County Courts and related resolution of City Council. Mr. Rosenberg. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <laughs> The matter before you this evening involves a possible arrangement between Augusta County and the city involving Augusta County's court facilities located in the city of Stanton. Before I delve into the details of the arrangement, let me first briefly provide some context. There is a pending court proceeding initiated in September by the circuit court for the 25th Judicial Circuit regarding the condition of the city's juvenile and domestic relations district court. That court, though a city court, is located in the county's general district courts building on Johnson Street. The county is a party to a similar proceeding concerning the condition of all three of its courts located in the city. Its circuit court, its general district court, and its juvenile and domestic relations district court. These proceedings require both the county and the city to take certain actions to address the current condition of their respective court facilities. Once those proceedings were commenced, there was renewed dialogue between representatives of the city and the county about the future of the county's court facilities in the city. During the renewed dialogue, the parties discussed yet again a possible financial contribution by the city to construction of a new county court facility in the city. Last month, the county very clearly communicated that it has no desire to move forward with a project in the city, even with such a city financial contribution and that it intends to pursue construction of a new court facility in Verona. With that communication, we began to consider whether the city might come to control the county owned properties in the city, located as they are at one of our major downtown intersections and their future uses. And that brings us to where we are today. At its essence, the proposed arrangement before you for consideration this evening includes two elements. First, the county would convey five properties to the city at no cost. Those five properties include the county's historic courthouse, its district courts building across Johnson Street, an historic residence adjacent to the district courts building, the former county jail, and a vacant lot. The properties are presently assessed for tax purposes with a value just over $2 million. In exchange for the conveyance of the properties, city council would take a position supporting the enactment of legislation that would permit the county to conduct a referendum in November of 2022, four years sooner than permitted under current law, 
to relocate its courts from the city to Augusta County. The arrangement is embodied in two documents included in your agenda package for this evening's meeting, a proposed memorandum of understanding and a proposed resolution. If adopted, the resolution would do two things, approve the memorandum of understanding and express council's support of the proposed legislation. Procedurally, here is where matters stand. Last evening, the County Board of Supervisors conducted a public hearing on the disposition of its properties as required by state law and approved the proposed memorandum of understanding. This evening, as I've mentioned, a proposed resolution is before council for consideration. If council adopts the resolution and the memorandum of understanding is then signed on behalf of the county and the city, the County Board of Supervisors is required by the MOU to take further action on or before January 12th of 2022 to approve the conveyance of the properties to the city. The General Assembly convenes on the same date, January 12th. And once the MOU is signed on behalf of the city and the county, we expect that Senator Emmett Hanger and Delegate John Avoli will introduce the legislation sought from the General Assembly. Because it is a special act addressing an issue of local concern, passage of the legislation requires an affirmative vote by two thirds of each of the two houses of the General Assembly. And once passed, the enacted legislation, like all bills, must be approved by the governor of Virginia, and when approved, would become effective on July 1st, 2022. If all of this were to occur, the county would then be authorized to conduct a referendum in November of 2022. Without diving even more deeply, in the event the referendum is approved, the conveyance of the properties to the city would not actually occur until the county's occupancy of a new court facility in Verona. That date is likely several years away as the county must first design, finance, and construct its facility. During the intervening period of time, in anticipation of its acquisition of the properties, the city could undertake its own planning process, ultimately facilitating decisions about the future uses of the properties by the city or other parties. Subject to further study, the properties may be suitable to meet some needs of the city. For example, for several years, the city's capital improvement plan has included a new facility for the police department, which has outgrown its space in City Hall. Staff have been searching for an appropriate location. Additionally, if the proposed arrangement moves forward, the city will need space to house the city's juvenile and domestic relations district court, currently administered jointly with the county's court and located in the county's general district court's building on Johnson Street. The joint administration and co-location of the county and city juvenile courts cannot continue if the county's courts move to Verona because the city's court must be located within city limits. Finally, let me highlight for you two sets of information we have provided to you, which I hope you have found useful as you have considered the proposed arrangement. First, we have furnished to you data concerning the operating cost incurred by the county over the last few years for the four out of the five properties that are improved with buildings. Those costs, as reported to us by the county, have ranged from a low of $116,000 in FY 2019 to a high of $147,000 in FY 2021 though the FY 2021 cost includes significant non-recurring flood cleanup and abatement expenses. Such operating costs would not be the responsibility of the city 
until the date on which it actually acquires the properties several years from now. And after that acquisition, during any period that the buildings are not occupied, we can expect the operating costs to be reduced. Second, we also furnished you information about the city's capacity to incur debt to finance the renovation of one or more of the buildings once they are acquired by the city. Generally, the analysis completed by the city's chief finance officer, Phil Trayer, shows an additional $18 million in debt capacity will be available for capital projects beginning in FY 2026, assuming that one, tax rates and the CIP remain unchanged, two, bonds are issued at an interest rate of 3%, and three, bonds are amortized over a 30-year period. Notably, any such renovations can be phased and need not be undertaken simultaneously. At, at this point then, I'll remind you that you have a single item before you for consideration, a resolution which if adopted will approve the proposed memorandum of understanding and will express council support for the proposed legislation. Mr. Blair, the city attorney and I and other members of city staff are ready for any questions you may have. Mayor Oaks, Councilor Darby. Thank you, Mr. Rosenberg. Mayor Oaks, I move to postpone consideration of the resolution approving the memorandum of understanding with Augusta County and endorsing special legislation for the 2022 General Assembly, permitting Augusta County to conduct a referendum on November 8th, 2022, to construct a new court facility in Augusta County, Virginia, until November 3rd, 2022, on which date staff is directed to schedule and notice a public hearing on this subject. There's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Mayor Oaks. Mayor Oaks. Can Councilor Holmes. I'll second that. All right, there's a second. Any further discussion, Mr. Rosenberg? If I may, I think I, I perhaps heard Ms. Darby uh, refer to an incorrect date. Um, I believe um, that you mentioned a November 2022 date for the date to which it would be postponed. And I wonder whether you meant to refer to the date of council's first meeting in January. No, in no. November. After the referendum. After the referendum. November 10th, I believe, is going to be the date, though. Well, this, the election is on November the 2nd. So uh, anytime after the election is what I'm saying. According to the, uh, the motion, the referendum is to go go forward yeah. on November 8th. Yes. The, the election day this year was November 2nd. And due to the calendar change and, and the way, you know, we, we jump a day every year, um, the election has to, I think, always be the first Tuesday yeah. after the first day of November. So it'll actually be November 8th of the next year, November 8th, 2022. So it's your, just to make sure I understand, it's your intention for the public hearing to, to occur after the election? Yes. I think that is fine. Um, and I'm willing to do that at that time. Um, if we want to, what date? No, November the 8th is what November you're saying? November 8th is the referendum. It's a Tuesday. November 10th would be the Thursday thereafter. Yes. Correct. November. This is Brenda Mead. I'd like to propose uh, an amendment to uh, this motion, if possible. I would like to change the date from November 3rd to November the 10th of 2022, at which time staff is directed to schedule a notice for a public hearing on the matter. So we have a motion on the floor. We have a second. Uh, and, right. All right. Can there be further discussion Any further before you vote on this? Uh, hold on one second, sir. Um, any further discussion? I'm, I'm Mr. Um, Madam Mayor. Mr. Blair, did you um did you have um a comment? 
So we have the motion and second. And now, Ms. Mead, do you want to make an amendment, a proposed an amendment? Uh, well, I, I maybe just as part of this discussion, uh, if, if we have our motion and a second, right. um, do we have a second yet? Well, we, we I'll, do. I'll withdraw the second until I hear what you have to say. Uh, well, we need we, to have a second, a second in order to have a discussion. Oh, okay. Well, then well, I'll point of second. order here. Uh, sir, we um, didn't close the debate. Sir, sir, we're, we're not done yet. Um, if you can wait one moment, we'll get to matters from the public in just a moment. Okay. All right. Okay. So we have a motion on the floor. We have a second. Any further discussion? This is Brenda. Yes, uh, Go ahead, Carolyn. Ms. Councilor Carolyn Dole. Dole, uh, I, I'm not sure why. What the point is of postponing? the whole thing uh, until after the next election. I, I feel like the, the whole, the problem with this whole issue right now is ideally Augusta County would have given thought to what they wanted and would have contacted us some months ago and we could have each held public hearings and let uh, each of our constituents know what was going on and what the options were and the possibilities. Um, and I still think they, sh they should be able to hear all that and, and to give their opinion. And just since that uh, initial proposal, which was only a couple weeks ago, it's, all, it's already changed. And the legislation that they're proposing, we have not seen. I, I think it's, I, I, I would like to see us do a reset. Like the world wouldn't come to an end if we just took everything and moved it a year. And we each, each of the localities would have a year to educate their constituents on the pros and cons and all the information. And then let's, let's, and then if we're in agreement and everyone feels like they have all the information, we could have the delegate and senator submit legislation next year for a referendum in 23. Just move everything like that. And because I, I know it's not just Stantonians, but Augusta County residents are upset at how this came out of nowhere and no one feels like they know what's going on. So that's just my suggestion. Madam Mayor. All right, Councillor Claffey. I think we have to recall that the Board of Supervisors last night went ahead and approved this. And we have both uh, Emmett Hanger and John Avoli planning on initiating legislation in Richmond with or without our blessing. So therefore, I think what we're trying to do is saying, fine, you go ahead with your referendum in 11 months on November 8th, let Augusta County decide what they wanna do, whether they wanna vote it up, vote it down, and then we'll decide what we wanna do. But we certainly don't want to go out here and support their change in the referendum if it's not going to do us any good and we don't have an opportunity to analyze these buildings, uh, see what the cost, the net costs are going to be for us. So let Augusta County, who has decided that they're determined to have this referendum moved up, allow them to go ahead and have the referendum. And if they approve it, well, then we'll re regroup next November and we'll decide what we want to do. If they don't approve it, it's a mute point. All right. Any further discussion? Well, David, I'd like to add to that as Chancellor you know, Holmes. Uh, pretty much we've been told. Further discussion. Sir, uh, uh, sir, it's, let it's, us finish. Uh, we'll, we'll you, be right you can there. speak under matters from the public. So if you can uh, hang in there um, with us for a little bit longer. All right. Chancellor gonna, Holmes. I was just going to say, you know, they pretty much gave us an ultimatum either take it or leave it. And you know, I, I just I don't want that. I don't want the courthouse to fall into any more disrepair than it already is. And that's that's my biggest concern. I know that if we took it, we would at least 
try to make it functional and do something with it. Whereas if, if the county decides to move, you know, um, we might not have that opportunity. And, and, that, and that's, a, that's a concern of mine. Uh, agreed, but I think we have to realize that the courthouse is going to be utilized for the next four years regardless, because right. it's gonna take Augusta County that long to move to Verona. So therefore, I don't think we have to worry about it deteriorating in the next four years, but this whole idea of us having to make a decision instantly. Four hours of getting. And, and believe it or not, for the general public, we got a change of the memorandum of understanding today. Now, Augusta County voted on it last night, and there is a, there's been a subtle change in the wording since, since this morning. So therefore, this thing is very much a, a rolling stone, and I don't think we ought to stop it here today. We ought to allow that thing to roll on down until November, let Augusta County decide what they want to do, and then we'll regroup and figure it out from there. Mayor Oaks. <clears throat> Councilor Darby. I, I, you know, I just think, I just think that, you know, clearly citizens want to have some input in this. And, you know, I, I'm not opposed to that, but the reason that I'm saying, let's just wait and see what this does, because, you know, if this doesn't make it through for Augusta County, then obviously we know where we stand. But, you know, I, I just want everybody to know, I'm not opposed to hearing, having a public hearing sooner than, you know, this, but, you know, I think we do need some time because we just don't have enough information at this point to know what the city would be taking on if we did get these buildings, um, you know, from a financial standpoint. Um, and, you know, I just, I just don't think that that's looking out for the best interest of Stanton right now, so. Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. <clears throat> well, um, I reckon I could say uh, I can count votes as well as anybody. Um, I, I know I'm on the losing end of this battle tonight. I can tell you point blank. I am unfortunately in disagreement with most of my council members. I honestly think that we need to take a look at this and accept the offer that is being put before us. I think that uh, I, I worry about that if we turn this offer down, that you, we're talking about, well, we once come in, if, this, if it passes, then we're going to get those buildings. I honestly don't think we are because I think we're going to tick the cotton picking county off so bad that they're going to tell us to take a hike. And then I worry about that beautiful 1901 historic courthouse sitting there and rotting in four or five or six years. And this city has got a lot of needs um, that it needs to take. You know, we're looking for a new police building. There's a perfect building down there that we can rehab. There's a lot of other issues I think that we could use with getting these five pieces of property. I think we're making a big mistake, but I also hope and pray that I'm proven wrong. So I will be voting no on this portion. Any further discussion? Yes. Uh, no, sir, this is for the city council only. Um, we're not at matters from the public yet. <laughs> we'll, we'll get there, I promise. All right, um, so I've had a chance to speak with the citizens and listen to what the citizens have had to say on this matter. And it is very clear, they do not want to lose the county seat here in Stanton and to slow the process down. Ms. Smith, please call the roll. Ms. Dole. Ms. Dole. I guess I, I, I don't like the thoughts of having a public hearing a year from now, but I mean, but it'll be I. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. No. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Holmes. I agree with Carolyn, but I'm going to say aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. And, and please understand that we can have public hearings before this time period. 
Okay, the, the next item, all right, we, we need to move on. We're almost to the matters from the, um, for the public, I promise. All right, the next item is matters from the city manager. Um, Madam Mayor, given the late item, I'll, I'll, I'll pass, thank you. All right, next is matters from the public. Mr. Blair's making me read the guidelines. Take the time to get ready. All right. You love that. This, all right, matters from the public. This part of city council's agenda is entitled matters from the public. It is a time that council sets aside to hear from citizens and others about a wide variety of subjects. Before we begin, I'd like to share five basic ground rules that we ask you respect, we ask for you to respect as you make your remarks. Number one, Please come to the podium or begin your call, identify yourself, and complete your remarks within five minutes. I will let you know when you've reached your five minutes. We ask that you please give your name, your address, and then keep your remarks at five minutes or less. When you reach the five minute time limit, I will let you know that your time limit has expired. If you continue to speak, I will ask you to step away from the podium or to end your call. If you continue to speak after I inform you that you have exceeded your time limit, I will again ask you to please stop speaking and step away from the podium or end your call. If you still continue to speak, I will ask the clerk of council to end your call. And if you continue to speak from the podium, you may be charged with disorderly conduct under Virginia code section 18.2-415A2. Number two, this is a time for us as a council simply to listen to your remarks. In an effort to encourage and maintain orderly conduct, we will not engage in give and take debate. If you are seeking information, you may mention it during your remarks and the city manager or his staff may get in touch with you in the days ahead. Number three, we ask that you direct your comments to council as a whole and not to identify members of council or to an individual employee of the city. If you wanna take up an issue with an individual member of council or an employee, please speak with us before or after the meeting. We are also accessible by phone, mail, or email. Again, we ask that you direct your comments to the council as a whole. Number four, we expect every speaker to be civil and courteous, using profanity, making personal attacks on an individual unrelated to the performance of their official duties on behalf of the city of Stanton and doing anything that is disruptive to the orderly conduct of this meeting will not be tolerated. Number five, finally, as the presiding officer, it is my duty to remind you that if you choose not to abide by these ground rules, I may find you that you're out of order and will ask you to withdraw from the podium or to end your call. We certainly do not want to reach that point and even beyond. So we respectfully ask for your full cooperation in observing these guidelines. If you wish, you may obtain a copy of the ground rules from our interim clerk of council, Ms. Smith. And now we welcome all speakers. The podium is now available for matters from the public as well as remote participation using Zoom platform. All right. The matters from the public is now open and you may approach the podium if you would like to address the council. And welcome. My name is Bob Miller. I live at 506 East Beverly Street. <clears throat> I really don't have much more to say here tonight. I think what you, the action you've taken uh, is exactly what I would have wanted two or three days ago. I went to the county meeting. They were open. We discussed pros and cons of what they want to do. Basically, the most important thing that you were asked to do tonight was to authorize another vote next year, November or so of 22, rather than November of 26. They want to move the vote up. The reason is they felt that moving the county to Verona was predicated on buying a new courthouse for $45 million and, and that's the Augusta Board of Supervisors wanted a, a new court building. And the public said, no, we don't want to spend. Uh, now, when they go back, whether it's 22 or 26, they're going to say, do you want it in Stanton, where it's going to cost $100 million? Or do you want it in Augusta County, Verona, where it's going to cost $80 million? I think the result of that vote is going to be totally different. Augusta County needs time to plan whatever they're going to do. And uh, there is no excess of planning time. They will invest money uh, in design, in physical preparation for the new facility so that 
when the vote is taken uh, next November or November of 26, uh, they will be ready to move forward. If they don't move long before 26, they're going to start paying fines. And here they are caught in a situation that we have forced on them. Uh, if the vote comes out, we want to keep it in the city, even though it's going to cost us maybe $20 million more dollars. Uh, the Augusta County Board will keep it in the city. But you've got to admit that they were certainly jerked around by uh, the bank there asking nine plus million dollars for property appraised for two. In 10 years, they won't be there because banks are going to consolidate. We're going to have a lot of empty bank buildings. I guarantee that. But anyway, what I have to say is unimportant because you've already voted. And uh, I'm kind of sad to see that. I wish you had been there last night. Augusta County was a whole lot more open. They listened to me and my ideas changed quite a bit. They have been working on a solution for years and years. And uh, I think that what they offer is about as best as the best Stanton could expect. Uh, they're certainly not going to be very happy with the vote tonight. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. That's all I have to say. All right. Um, do we have anyone with their hand raised? I have no one with their hand raised. All right. Welcome. Once again, it's Nathaniel Showalter, um, 316 Hayes Avenue. And um, my question is, uh, I know um, Bren, Councilwoman Brenda Mead had had an uh, amendment she had, was proposing. I kind of wanted to hear what she had to say on the previous issue. And as well, I also wanted to ask and see if you could um, form a historical um, committee to see if there's any grants either here in the state of Virginia um, nationally, because um, this courthouse represents not only the history of um, Virginia, Stanton and Augusta County, but pretty much the entire Midwest of the United States. Therefore, we may be able to get, to get grant money from other um, states to restore the courthouse and turn it into maybe a museum or something of historical importance. And I speak not only as a Virginia resident, but also as a resident of, um, sorry, Michigan, when I had moved there for a few years. All right, thank you. Anyone with their hand raised? I have no one with their hand raised. Would anyone else like to address the... Good evening, my name is Timothy Scheidt. I live at 1828 Spring Hill Road. You know, I find it funny. When I was a young kid, my grandmother used to tell me when I was trying to do something and I kept always failing at whatever I was doing, she would say, Tim, stop rearranging the chairs in the Titanic. The ship is sinking. This ship has sunk. And you're sitting here trying to figure out do we pass this amendment? Do we not pass this amendment? Oh my God, we should have a public hearing. I agree with that. You should have a public hearing. You should give the citizens the right to express their concerns. And I appreciate when you do that. You didn't do that tonight. You came in here, you took a vote and you didn't hear from us before you took that vote. Shame on you. You could have done that. You chose not to. This is the problem with the city of Stanton in Augusta County. Augusta County has been acting in bad faith for years. And y'all have been trying to keep them. The county showed you their colors last night. Did you watch their board of supervisors meeting when it got to public comment? When it got to the board members comment at the end of the meeting, they were yelling at people that were there for other things. They don't have respect for their own citizens. They're not gonna have respect for you. Their sheriff runs these courthouses in your city. You've seen the headlines in the newspapers about what the sheriff has done. Do, were you at the court on Monday, Tuesday, when the sheriff had a case before a judge? I have the, the transcripts right here. I'm gonna give them to you. I'm gonna email them to everybody since not everybody's here. The solution is simple, sink the ship. Tonight, you had the opportunity to take full control of those buildings. I don't agree with you on hardly anything. I just open honesty here. I don't. I'm a liberal Democrat. We're not going to agree. I agree with you tonight. Y'all made a mistake. You had an opportunity 
to take full control of this situation. If you think for one moment that this county is, the Augusta County is not moving that courthouse down the road and building their courthouse down there, you're wrong because they're gonna do it. And if they have to strip the citizens of Augusta County of their right and their choice from a couple years ago, they will do it. They've shown you their true colors. And now you have taken the cards out of your hand, which is one of the most irresponsible things I've seen you do. You had the, that, and you're right, those buildings are going to sit there and they're going to decay and the county is going to have ownership of them for years and years and years and you're going to have nothing. And that is on you. There's one other thing I want to address besides this courthouse because I'm so sick of this courthouse. This should have been done years ago. A couple months ago, there were discussions within this city about ending the mutual aid compact between the police department in Augusta County and Stanton. I encourage each one of you to take a look at that compact and end it this year. The relationship between Augusta County and Stanton is dangerous, it's poisonous, and it's gonna get more and more people killed in this city because the Augusta County government and the sheriff in general is out of control and he will kill at all costs. He is not afraid to call out people. He is not afraid to use language that I'm not going to repeat from this microphone tonight. The relationship with Augusta County is over. It's time for the city to stand on its own two feet, which we're fully capable of doing. And you all know that. So end it and be done with Augusta County. Thank you. Any callers? I have no one with their hand raised. Would anyone else like to address the city council? Hello, welcome. How are you? Mask or no mask? Can you hear me like this? Yes. Yeah. All right, so my name is Antoine Suter. Um, I'm the president of Black Lives Matter, Shenandoah Valley. Um, if not all of you know, then I'm sure maybe a few of you do know, we protested the Augusta County Sheriff's Office for about 80 days um, for body camps and transparency and FBI investigation into the community. Um, over the process of the time of us protesting, we've had plenty of incidents happen to where um, we've used city resources, Stanton City's resources. We've come to Stanton City to protest the Gus County uh, Circuit Court. Um, and that kind of plays into where um, Avoli was talking about it being more feasible. You know, like I said, we're using resources to protest the Augusta County Sheriff's Office and Circuit Court. Um, and we plan on as long as we have to, as long as the sheriff is still doing what he's doing in Augusta County, we're going to keep doing that as long as Augusta County Circuit Court buildings are in Stanton City. Um, I came here to express my gratitude to the Stanton, to certain officers um, with the Stanton Police Department um, for respecting and acknowledging our um, constitutional and our civil rights um, while protesting. We've never not once gotten ticketed or arrested for protesting in the, Stanton, in the city of Stanton. Um, outside of the sheriff's office, we've had over 15 arrests and um, citations, which, um, as Mr. Scheich has said, we are, which um, it ties into court that happened on um, Tuesday. Um, so um, to Spence and step into um, uh, Chief Williams and to anybody else who has, we to where we have used city resources and they were involved, I would like to express my gratitude for that reason. Um, I am supporting the whole idea of the Augusta County Circuit Courthouse not being in Stanton City. And I just explained why, not only just using city resources, um, but it doesn't, it, why, why should you guys have to worry about Augusta County's buildings? Not only just because of um, it's in Stanton City, but because of the sheriff. Um, I believe that the sheriff in Augusta County is part of an infection. And I feel like um, part of removing the courthouse out of Stanton is part of um, getting rid of that infection. Um, and thank you. Thank you. Right. Anyone on Zoom? All right. Would anyone? Uh, well, I have to let everyone else. Uh, we only al allow one, uh, Mr. Blair, one speaker at a time. One speaker per 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 meeting. Per meeting. Okay. Uh, per for public comment. For public comment. Um, would anyone else like to address the council? All right. Well, hearing none, I would once again like to wish everyone happy holidays, and this meeting is now adjourned.